Keller. Here. I believe Commissioner Thompson will be joining us shortly. Vice Chair Barrera. Here. And Chair Donaldson. Here. We have a quorum of six commissioners present. Okay, this is the time for public comment for items that are not on our agenda. Is there anybody wishing to speak? Being no one, I will ask us, uh, let's look at the action recap. The minutes for the action recap from October 26th. No corrections, I move approval. Second. Without objection, any objections? Okay. Okay, well, we do need um, an abstention. Commissioner Banta was absent. I'll abstain. So. And, of course, Commissioner Thompson is absent at the moment, so right. this will be 5-0. Five, five do we need a roll call? I don't think okay. so. Okay, could we have the director's report, please? Certainly. So with regard to city council actions, the council has met three times since your last meeting, which was in October. They met on November 7th, November 21st, and December 5th. On November 7th, the council held a study session on the local hazard mitigation plan for 2017 to 2022. This is the same document that you reviewed at your October meeting. The council received an informational report on the development impact fees for fiscal year 1617, and that report then uh, came back to the council uh, a few weeks later on December 5th and was approved. The council approved the Doyle Street Muse project, which involves demolition of four existing legal residential units and two existing illegal residential units and replacing them with six new residential condominiums. The commission recommended approval at your September meeting, uh, as you may recall. <coughs> Uh, concerning Horton Street bike lanes, the council approved the installation of flexible bollards on Horton Street between 53rd and 59th Street, except for a few segments that are too narrow, as a protected bike lane pilot project. And finally, on November 7th, the council approved something that's called the Public Market Short-Term Parking Phase 2 project. This involves the uh, new segment of Shellmont Street that's currently being constructed uh, through the public market area, uh, a plan for short-term parking on that street after it's completed, which would include 11 two-hour parking stalls, two 15-minute parking stalls, one motorcycle parking stall, two valet parking stalls, and one commercial loading zone. Um, this, was, this recommendation was approved by the Transportation Committee at its September 21st meeting. <coughs> On November 21st, the Council had a study session on the Sherwin-Williams Park and Open Space Final Development Plan and a potential credit of the Parks and Recreation Facilities impact fee. The FDP, of course, is on your agenda tonight for you to consider its approval and Miru will go over the Council's comments in her presentation. The Council reviewed the results of a request for qualifications for Emeryville's first cannabis storefront retailer and they selected two operators, Rochambeau Incorporated and East Bay Therapeutics. These selected firms are now assembling application packages for land use permits from the Planning Commission and operators permits from the Police Department. Major conditional use permit applications for these two cannabis retail establishments will be on your agenda in the coming months, although those applications have not been submitted <coughs> yet. This is distinct, different from the three cannabis manufacturing applications that are on your special agenda next week. Uh, finally, on November 21st, the council elected John Bowders as mayor and Ali Medina as vice mayor, as I'm sure you already know, for 2018, and they were both sworn into office. And last Tuesday, December 5th, uh, the Council authorized the Acting Public Works Director to solicit bids for construction of the South Bayfront Pedestrian Bicycle Bridge, finally. Okay. And um, the Council also heard a presentation about one-way car share and gave direction for preparation of an ordinance on that topic. Mm -hmm. Finally, I just want to remind you that you have a special meeting next Wednesday uh, December 20th for consideration of these three cannabis manufacturing applications. The packet for that meeting is in front of you, so we will not be having Pedal Express deliver it. Um, I can confirm that you've all received it, because you've got it right there. Um, 
My understanding is that all but Commissioners Kang and Guerrero will be at that meeting next Wednesday. Is that correct? So we'll see five of you on Wednesday, <coughs> uh, the 20th at 6.30 p.m. Um, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Any questions? No? Okay, disclosure of conflicts of interest and ex parte communications. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I had some communication with the Sherwin-Williams applicant. Okay. Um, I have to recuse myself from the Sherwin-Williams application because the company that I work for does work for the developer. So I will turn it over to Vice Chair. Okay, and I will open the public hearing for um, Sherwin-Williams Pu uh, public Park and Open Space Final Development Plan. You don't, you don't need to open the public hearing oh, yet. I'm uh, sorry. After the presentation. Okay, never mind. Good evening, uh, Commissioners. Uh, this is a public hearing, a decision public hearing uh, for a uh, final development plan for uh, open space and uh, public park and open space of the Sharon Williams project. Uh, you have seen this over the last year a number of, me a number of times, uh, and it started with the approval of the PDP and PUD back in November of two 2016. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, there have been a number of meetings where uh, the project has developed over the last year. These include uh, two community meetings, uh, three study sessions with the Planning Commission, uh, and it was reviewed twice by BPAC and three times by the Parks and Recreation Committee meeting. And this is kind of the chronology showing you the process uh, that this project has gone through, uh, starting from a very conceptual idea of what the, the park and open space would look like uh, to today where we have a concrete plan. So this is, again, uh, very familiar to you. And what I will be focusing on are the changes that have been made since uh, the commission last saw it in October. Um, so, so the changes to the proposal are that they have added storage sheds and seating areas to the community garden. Uh, they have added more lights along the east-west uh, bike pedestrian alley uh, near the sculpture garden, garden as well as the dog park. They have added more water fountains and trash cans at key locations. They have added more uh, bike racks near building entrances as well as the basketball court. Uh, they have add, added sparkle flades to the concrete pavers near the sculpture garden. Uh, they have modified basketball half court to regulation size uh, half court. Uh, and it includes the removal of two existing trees on Sherwin Avenue and replacement uh, of those with Brisbane box to match uh, the species on south side of the uh, street. Uh, in terms of uh, the basketball court, if you recall, uh, the commission uh, discussed whether it would be half court or a full court, and this question was posed to the Parks and Recreation Committee, and they recommended uh, that a fair compromise was to have a, a regulation size half court. Uh, the, this question was also asked to the city council at the study session uh, last month. Uh, there was some discussion back and forth between half court and full court, and uh, in the end, they sort of said that we will uh, defer to the planning commission uh, regarding this issue. Uh, the second issue that I want to highlight today is uh, the trees on Sherwin Avenue. <coughs> So these are the two trees uh, that are being proposed to be removed. And they, this is sort of the picture of them uh, 
of these two trees. And they are, in the terms of size, they are seven uh, inches and 11 inches in uh, diameter at breast uh, height. And per the arborist report, one is in poor condition and other is in fair condition. And the reason for removal is to plant new trees along the entire length of Sherwin Avenue on the north side under good soil conditions. The entire entire land, uh, sidewalk is going to get rebuilt, and this is an opportunity to have the same species uh, grow in better soil conditions. I'm bringing this up and uh, talking uh, about it is because we received an email from uh, Council Member Martinez, who is recommending that uh, the, these, these two trees uh, remain and not be removed. And in terms of the species, uh, she was fine with uh, choosing uh, species which are in the area. So that is something uh, for the commission to consider as to what uh, the commission would like to do. Uh, in terms, so I'm not going to go through the various images. Uh, the applicant will be uh, doing that uh, for the benefit of the commission as well as uh, the public at large. So I'm going to go through the findings that you need to make today. Uh, the finding, the fundamental finding is that, uh, that, 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 that this FTP substantially conforms with the approved PDP uh, and that the conditions of approval of the PUD uh, have been met. Uh, the proposed FTP uh, for the park, greenway, open space conforms exactly as outlined in the PDP. Uh, in terms of applicable conditions of approval of the PDP, these have been met, and they primarily related to obtaining comments from the community and various committees, obtaining approval of the tentative map, which uh, the commission approved a few months ago, uh, installation of a bike share station, and dedication of the land for public park and open spaces. So all these have been met by the applicant, and therefore staff believes that the finding uh, can be made. In terms of other applicable plans and policies which apply to this project, one is the Park Avenue District Plan. Uh, there are three main uh, guidelines uh, that are applicable. One is regarding the tree plantings, uh, that they should all be ginkgo, bilboa, uh, Bil biloba trees. Uh, this is a question that we asked very early on to the commission in terms of uh, whether the commission would be okay if there were other trees and the commission seemed to be uh, agreed that uh, you, you, there could be a variety of trees in the area. Uh, the district plan also calls for benches, trash cans, and other street furniture to be made of metal. Uh, the proposed, uh, most of the trash cans and benches are metal, but there are some wood uh, seating areas as well. Uh, it also says that the standard Emeryville light pole be used except on the greenway, which is what it does. So the standard light pole is uh, going to be on the roads, whereas uh, along the greenway, it will be the same lights as the greenway lights in the other parts uh, of uh, the city. So uh, staff believes that given that, uh, the uh, project complies with the Park Avenue District Plan. We also have the Park and Recreation Strategic Plan uh, and the recommended program for, uh, for a park in this area is to allow play for children, uh, allow play spaces for socializing, recreation with dogs, exercise and fitness, viewing art and walking and jogging and biking. We believe that all these components have been met. There is play areas for small children, there is a play area for teenagers, uh, you have have open uh, lawn in the public area for socialization, socializing and relaxing. Uh, there is a dog park. Uh, there is exercise equipment along the greenway uh, for adults. Uh, and of course, the greenway allows for walking and jogging and biking. In terms of environmental review, uh, an EIR was uh, certified by the council uh, in September of last year. Uh, and there have been no substantial changes since then in the project or any change in the circumstances under which the project will be undertaken. And there's no new information that has been received regarding the project that would require additional analysis. So the final EIR that was adopted uh, still applies. Uh, so with that, I conclude my presentation uh, uh, with the recommendation that the commission approve uh, subject to conditions of approval attached to the staff report.
Uh, just one last comment. Oh. In the packet, the plan set that you received, uh, you may see a number of additional sheets and more information. These, I kind of made them do it, and it's more for the purposes of implementation and the ease of that. So you have, you know, things like stormwater plans. You have things like uh, a vested tentative map there so that you can compare. So it's more for, it's nothing additional. It's more that's already has been approved. and it's just easier for staff to, when it comes during building, it's just easier to have everything together. So in case you were wondering why it's li looking a little thicker, then that would be the explanation. So with that, I'm open for questions. Uh, the uh, applicant does have a presentation as well. Are there any questions for staff? Go ahead. Do you have questions? Mm -hmm. Haru, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I have two I'm a little bit of a disadvantage. I was not here for the last study session, so forgive me if my questions have already been answered. Uh, in the open space uh, overall diagram, um, I, I, know, I know there is an there is an alley between lots two, two and four, and lot one. I think. In uh, which page are you? Which you page are you? Uh, LP005. Okay. Um, right. So the, the 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 lots are indicated in is is large white rectangles mm -hmm. and it says lot 4 not apart lot 2 not apart. Mm -hmm. But there is, as I understand, unless I have missed something, I think there is a publicly accessible alley between uh, the building on lot two and the building on lot one, and also between the building on lot four and the building on lot one. Is that correct? That is correct, and it'll stay. And you will see that uh, when you see the FTP plan. But that is private property. That's not part of the public open space. Okay, so that explains why it's not part of this. Right. Great. Thank you. It's where the dashed black line is there on the drawing. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, then I'll have the applicant come over and make this presentation. This is the plans. Okay. Then here. Let's start with that, This is uh, this one. All right. So okay. they're right at the bottom. All right. Well, thank you, Maru, and uh, good evening, commissioners. Kevin Ma with Lennar again. Good to see everybody, and uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to, you know, it just really struck me when Maru put that timeline up of uh, what we've been doing over the last year, or just over a year since the FDP got approved. And um, really what I want to do is uh, is thank staff and, and thank the Park Avenue Residence Committee for uh, taking this journey with us over the last 12 months because it has been a, a very, uh, we've had a, a lot of meetings, a lot of outreach, a lot of great feedback, and uh, we are very excited to be in front of you this evening uh, for potential approval of the uh, of the parks and open space here tonight. Um, and so thank you guys again. It's, it's been a great year, and uh, we're, we're looking to, to get to the final legs of the, uh, of the journey here soon in terms of the FTP process. Um, and so with me tonight, uh, um, as you guys might remember, Jim Benzman from EMA Design will be going through a lot of the, uh, the, the details. And so um, I'll, I'll just keep it short and sweet and, and have Jim walk you through. I think the idea was to just to give you guys a, a brief overview of, uh, of kind of the overall program and design and really concentrate on the changes that have been made since the last study session um, and kind of just in focus uh, the, the time on that. And if there's any questions or areas that the, any of the commissioners feel like that w they would want to uh, us to focus on, we're happy to just go ahead and let us know and we're happy to spend time there. But we just want to be respectful of everybody's time since this is, um, I know that that uh, all of us have kind of seen this uh, iteration many times uh, over the last 12 months. So uh, without further ado, uh, Jim, let's take it away. All right, good evening, planning commissioners. Here we are again. So uh, I think, you know, we just kind of thought we'd start
start with where we started um, back in January. Well, it seems like yesterday. Um, this was the uh, approved uh, PDP site plan, uh, and and um, kind of what we did is we had some community input uh, and and developed some concepts, ideas uh, from that. And I think let's see how do we make this? Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, all right. So then uh, out of that community meeting, we kind of developed this, you know, thought um, diagram and, and really got a lot of the feedback from the community uh, on, on what they were looking for, where they kind of saw all that happening. Uh, and then, you know, as, as you all know, we've distilled that down through, um, through this process. Oops. Um, these were some of the original images that we showed to the community and to uh, the planning commission. And um, you know some of them through the distillation process, through the development of this, you know have have changed, um, moved, altered slightly, and then more imagery of the open space, sort of the you know the activities that we we kind of or the community kind of saw uh, as as being important, um, you know areas on the lawn to. Um, watch a movie or just put a blanket out um, areas for food trucks sitting um, exercise and then um, you know some of the the areas uh, kind of the north of the site dog park children's play area uh, and then you know some interesting seating something that was kind of different and then and then just what that streetscape would look like uh, along Hubbard 46 and so that was the that initial package and and through that we um, you know we developed where we are today and that's here so oops. so just I, I'll just run through the changes and then um, I think Maru touched on them, but I'll, I'll run through them graphically. Uh, and then um, any questions, happy to answer whatever you have. So not really any changes here. This is the existing conditions, um, existing site photos. We're hoping for some changes here. Um, and then uh, the shadow study. Overall site plan, uh, kind of the major changes are, oh, you know what? Here, this is not the right one. Which one? This is not the correct presentation. It shows the old basketball court. <clears throat> uh -oh. Is it this guy? Oh, that's the other one. Yeah, maybe jump in. To, uh, I'll run to your computer. Yeah, I'll need to okay. run to my computer. I'm sorry about okay. this. Oh, Can know, we maybe use the... that? We we do have a hard copy here, Jim. Do you want to just yeah. put it on there, and we can kind of yeah, we can do that. Do a little hybrid session here. Yeah, here. We'll do that. All right. <coughs> so I'll just start with the um, site plan here. So um, the uh, kind of the major changes are the oh thank you uh, the the half court basketball court and there was some discussion at the last planning commission and Miru touched on that 
Um, so it changed from the circle to regulation half court basketball, um, so that you know as kids are playing, they're learning the the, the, the rules and dimensions. Uh, we also added um, storage sheds and seating to the. Um, Pardon me. I okay. think we've got it. Okay. Go. All right. Sorry about this, Commission. First one. Is that it? Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Yeah, this looks correct. So we added the, the uh, approved tentative map. Let's see. Yeah, this is it. Okay, great. Okay, so um, adding storage in the uh, community garden, adding seating in the community garden, uh, and then, um, you know, there's adding lights and, and um, some drinking fountains, which I'll go over on the uh, the amenities plan. Well, oh, sorry. real quick. So yeah. can we, sorry, can I just, because uh, I know one of the main topics tonight is going to be around the uh, basketball area and, the, and kind of the, the layout and the half versus full. And so what I just wanted to quickly kind of touch on is just a, a quick recap of how we got to uh, this current layout. And so really the, the original concept that we had was more of a informal half court basketball setup where it was not uh, fully regulation but more of a kind of a creative layout for the hard surface that would contain the, the basketball playing area. And really that came from uh, multiple feedback that we had gotten during the citywide community meetings and then also uh, meeting with the Park Avenue's residence committee about kind of with this park area, the, the overall idea had always been about kind of making it as flexible and maximizing the space as much as possible, uh, simply because, you know, land is such a uh, precious um, item for the, for the city of Emeril and the Bay Area in general, that we wanted to make sure that we could make sure, make sure that we're getting the most efficient or the, the most use out of, out of whatever we're, we're planning here. And so, you know, through some convers you know, through multiple conversations, we decided kind of more of this uh, flexible basketball space where if it wasn't being used for basketball, it could be used for group exercise or stretching or uh, just any other kind of activities would be kind of the preferred layout. And so as that kind of concept made its way through the, the summer and the fall, um, we started, you know, we'd kind of got some feedback in the last couple of study sessions about, well, can you look at it um, as maybe more of a regulation size half court or going to a full court. And so with that in mind, you know, we went back to the Parks and Rec Committee at our last hearing and kind of had uh, some good dialogue with the uh, committee members there about it. And ultimately, we, you know, we, we kind of talked about the pros and the cons. And ultimately, we basically uh, came, walked away with the recommendation from them, and then which has also uh, been uh, kind of had the same concurrence um, from the Park Avenue Residence Committee that a uh, regulation half court was kind of the preferred option, which I think um, as, as Lennar, we would prefer that as well, um, simply because the, the full court option was such a large uh, expanse of kind of paved area that would kind of uh, be placed into this area which didn't feel as kind of flexible and usable and uh, maybe took up a little bit too much of the uh, kind of flexible space and, and multi-programmatic areas that we you know we kind of always targeted for the uh, for the open space areas within the community and so uh, that's why you see this before you tonight and then we can open it up for for your feedback as well but I wanted to just at least kind of give a quick recap of, uh, of what, where we've gotten in this plan this evening. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, and I can I'll just go into some of those areas that uh, that have changed uh, in, in a little more detail. So uh, the enlargement of the uh, the park area. So you can see at the community garden, you know, we added these storage sheds or, or structures, whatever um, whatever they may be, and then you know some seating for the community garden. Um, not sure that it shows up quite well on this plan, but. And we've also added uh, a drinking fountain inside the community garden. Um, 
you know, for use uh, in there. And then let's see, I think that's it for that. And then this this enlargement shows the uh, the half court a little bit better, uh, and you can see, you know, it it just kind of fits in that space. Um, you know, we're showing a little bit of a, um, a fence in there that would be screened by the planting so that uh, it would contain the ball, you know, for people that are shooting. And then, um, so we just, um, we added uh, the, the approved um, PDP Emeryville section, or Emeryville Greenway section, excuse me. And then uh, this is largely the same. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it shows up quite that well in this plan, but um, so we had a meeting with BPAC uh, a couple weeks ago, and one of the comments was um, maybe locating a, a bike fix-it station in this area near the children's play area, and, uh, and we did that. Um, this is largely the same. And so this was um, one of the comments that came out of the last um, uh, planning session was uh, about the, the paving. And so um, we're proposing something that has a little bit of interest in it, some sparkle, you know, kind of has the mica flakes in it so that it reflects the sun and, and adds interest. And that, that um, lives kind of in the sculpture garden area. Um, nothing here. Not a lot of changes here. Um, let's see. So, the amenities area are the amenities diagram. So, um, the bike fixes station is located here and noted there. Um, so, we have two now. Uh, we previously had it located, one located here, and we shifted it down to this end um, under the recommendation of BPAC. And then um, the drinking fountains uh, at the uh, community garden and the basketball, uh, half-court basketball ball area as well. Um, we've also indicated the building entries. And the reason for doing that is, showing, is, is also to indicate the, uh, the bike racks that are, are near the building entry. So, um, you know, residents and people using that can, can lock a bike up nearby. And then uh, we added this diagram just to indicate that um, you know the things that we are proposing, the site amenities, do work at the streetscape uh, with the stormwater treatment and the um, the planting areas. And these these symbols uh, correspond to the um, <clears throat> excuse me the site uh, site amenities diagram. Uh, I don't believe any changes here. It's all largely the same, uh, and as Mira mentioned, there we added some uh, some lighting at the um, the Emeryville Greenway pass through. So one here, one here, and then we added three between lots two and four. Uh, we also added one near the sculpture garden, and uh, one at the uh, the dog park area here. And then uh, this diagram is the public trash collection, just indicating where the public trash cans are um, for, um, for trash collection. And I believe that's, that's the extent of the changes. I will um, I'll put it back on the site plan. I think that's probably easiest to talk to. Yeah, so I don't know if there's any like particular areas that the commissioners wanted us to maybe go back and answer some questions or cover more detail. We're happy to do so. Are there any commissioner questions? Uh, is that, does this conclude your presentation? The, yeah. yeah. For you. Um, I have some questions. Go ahead, Commissioner Bata. I have to uh, again apologize because since I was not here for the last uh, the last study session, so um, and probably this is an educational event for me. Um, the let's see. The, the, you have a slide there that showed the uh, benches, your proposed benches. Um, at the streetscape? I th well, where, wherever they are. Yeah, there you go. Right there, the six-foot bench. Correct. Is that, uh, 
an Emeryville standard or or is that, that your own selection? That's Emeryville standard. It's Emeryville mm -hmm. standard. Okay. Okay. Well, there's my education. So, um, do you have an image, or have you shown it earlier, of the fencing around the garden, the, the uh, Victory Garden area? That's a good question. We don't have an image of that. Okay. Well, I think generally uh, the, the fencing along the railroad side would be the same uh, kind of uh, wrought iron uh, fencing that it is, you see consistent uh, along the railroad in, in the city of Emeryville. But I don't know, were we planning to, to fence this, this portion of it off? With the park, I, are we going to keep that open? I think we, that would be fenced, uh, and it would it would um, we would continue that wrought iron fencing, something simple and and um, elegant around there. Uh, through the chair, if I may make a comment, yes, uh, there's ahead. a condition of approval that requires the fencing along the Greenway facing right at the uh, uh, railroad track to match the fencing on the other side of the railroad track. Does that help? That's great. So this, on the same sheet here, you have an image in the right hand, top of the right hand column, the uh, stones, the Soma stones, yes. which look great. Can you tell me roughly what dimensions, what the length and width might be of the typical stone? Uh, we, we do indicate that um, on the amenities, kind of the cut sheet pages, but uh, I think the largest one is uh, four by three feet. And then they, they're smaller from, the. I think there are two other sizes um, down from that. Okay. And then is the, uh, the, the green itself, are you anticipating that that might be used for like impromptu uh, performances, uh, you know, musical events or anything like that? Or is that not in the... <coughs> I mean, I think that'd I think, be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great if they did. Yeah, I mean, that I think our whole goal was to just have this as, as flexible for any type of outdoor gathering uses um, as the community would like to have. You, you, you may want to consider, I mean, it's perfectly arranged so that the seating um, or the people sitting on the, on the lawn facing north would look at a performer illuminated by the sun. You may want to provide a, a spot on the north on that pathway that has some electrical power potentially for amplification? Yeah, actually, that was one of the comments I believe we got out of the B, uh, the Parks and Rec Committee is that uh, I believe on some of these uh, standard greenway lighting, uh, street light or pedestrian uh, scale lights, at the base you can add a outlet okay. uh, that actually can be locked. And there is so, lighting. Because I know that was one of the comments that we had gotten. Was, there, there are lamps along that uh, path there? there? There is on the yeah, on, some over there. on the opposite side. I, it, I think I believe this is the area that you're talking about. Yeah, that, and there is a, a a light over here that's not shown on this plan actually. Uh, Commission Banta, uh, there is a condition of approval requiring them to have electrical uh, outlets in the public park. Okay. It doesn't specify where, uh, so if you want us to specify, then we can amend the condition. Oh, yeah. uh, well, sure I you think it's it right there. Yeah. probably sufficient if they're having it. I mean, you guys, it's your project. I think you'd want to make it as uh, easy as possible for whoever is going to do their thing to have the outlet nearby. So ideally, it would be right along that uh, property line that you've got there. But, you know, I'm not we're, sure. Uh, we're indicating a, a street light or a, a greenway light here. Yeah. And so maybe what we do is just add those outlets kind of all around that right. area. Because the other thing that but the, I think the original request for the power was like for kids' birthday parties, if they do the little, uh, the bounce house that yeah. needs the, uh, the, the fan to inflate it or the blower. So right. that was definitely had come up through our uh, community meetings. Um, on sheet uh, LP016, your uh, landscape trees. You, the, I have a question about two-year trees here. The... Uh, on the lower left, the maidenhair tree, and also the Chinese pistache, are those both deciduous trees? They are both deciduous, yes. And uh, so what is it, about a three or four month period when there's no leaves, or? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, roughly, Bay Area, maybe it's a little bit less. So the, the, the maidenhair tree, that's the ginkgo tree, is that, that correct? That is the ginkgo, correct. That's the one that will be going up the walkway, the uh, east-west right. walkway? 
And also in the uh, in the art plaza. Great. Uh, on page uh, LP026, which I think you were at just a minute ago. Yeah, there you go. So that that shows where the st the street lights are, and the, uh, in the in the in the pathway going from lot one up towards the tracks, mm -hmm. you have three lights there. Is that right? Three light posts. Correct. One, two, three. And that's, I guess you've done a, some sort of photometric study that suggests that's plenty of light? Uh, well, the photometric study was done before we added those lights, but I believe that's a condition of approval. Yes, there's a condition of approval, uh, which requires them to uh, give us the final lighting plan along with the photometric and uh, gives power to the public works director to require more uh, right. if necessary. Right. That actually brings me to my next question. Could you go back to those first slides you showed of these, the original concept images that you uh, presented to us? Yeah. Uh, is that, nope, this guy. Yes. Yeah, I think there was a couple before this. There you go. So these, I remember these images, I thought they were great, and I really was looking forward to seeing each one of these things in your project. <laughs> So I don't know if there was any discussion about this at the last study session or not, and I don't want to be a late arrival to the party, but um, just let's, for example, take lighting in the lower left, you have that sort of overhead wave lighting. Is that uh, gonna still be something forthcoming or is that, that was just didn't happen or how, what's the story with that? Yeah, and I think I think the idea for that was at the uh, the art plaza area, but um, kind of how that got distilled down was that uh, the video wall was something that um, the community was really looking forward to, and we felt like there was a conflict between the video wall and and um, you know the festoon lighting or the string lighting. Might that be something you would put in the on the private uh, alleyways between building lot one and two and four, or is that? again not in your plans that's not currently in our plans yeah i mean we, we currently don't have that but i think we could probably look at some opportunities no. somewhere within okay. you know across buildings to to put those like because i do agree i think it's a it's an interesting feature especially during for evening activation so so the other great images on this sheet which again i thought was just great was right next to the to the right is the uh, paley park type wall of water right do you have any fountains in your uh, in your project at this point uh no um water features we do not and and um i think the idea is just that you know they they are they consume a lot of water and they are a lot of maintenance so we we just kind of pull back from from that i think this that that's always the issue with showing imagery um you know this was more about sort of the movable seating that that urban plaza um you know kind of the the art plaza what that might feel like okay so how about the image right above <laughs> what is that exactly um that's the uh, <coughs> that's the video wall um i'm trying to think of where it is and i'm drawing a blank right now is that in so, chicago it's chicago yes yeah so is that actually a transparent wall with uh it kind of looks transparent. Maybe it's yeah. I think they, they project images of of um, faces on this, yeah, and right. it's sort of this rotating kind of art. And so, it's not transparent. Not transparent. So was you mentioned a video wall just a moment ago that you were talking about? Did I I missed where that is on your site? So that that's going to be in that uh, public art gallery area, but that'll be part of the building FDP, which you'll see next month. So that will be on the exterior. It'll be, because it's attached to the building, so okay. that's why it's not part right. of this Perfect. Uh, presentation and, tonight. And then the image just to the left, to the right of that, with all the people lounging on the high line, I'm presuming. Mm -hmm. Are you, are there, is there a similar situation you're creating in your site plan at all, where you have lots of lounge areas for people to just uh, relax? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, not specifically, and I think the, the concern was that the areas for lounging could turn into areas for overnight sleeping. I see. Okay. Yeah, and and then so to your point, Commissioner Bannon, one when you see the building FDP uh, next month in the uh, elevated outdoor courtyard areas, we do have many of these uh, kind of 
lounging oh, areas, right. but it will be kind of more for uh, access control. It'll be so there won't be that that concern won't, right. won't be there. Right. So, would you mind going to the next slide? <clears throat> sure. Oops. So this one here, I see that you have the stones that you showed in this slide, which I think are look great, and then. I, I was also really taken with the slide immediately to the right of the stones, the lower, that looks like a wooden boardwalk with wooden uh, benches and sides. I thought that was such a great uh, idea of introducing another texture at the ground plane that would have really enriched the project, but I think that that's uh, not in the, in, the, in the cards either, is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct. And we, we originally thought of this um, near the sculpture garden area, uh, but I think with the, uh, the fire truck access, um, you know, that, that material sort of changed to a, a decorative paver. Right. Okay. And then could you show the next slide? Now this one has in the upper, upper left these uh, vine covered trellises. Are those in any any location that you're proposing? Well, I think you'll see a riff on that um, with the building FDP because one of the comments that we got from Commissioner Keller last time was exploring some ways to soften up the <laughs> there's a part of a garage facade within the uh, art plaza area uh, that we're going to have a vertical application similar to that. And so you'll see that as part of a next month's study session. Great. I can't wait to see that. I've FTP it's gonna be good yes so well thank you for explaining all that to me and I have one last question for you on, on slide I don't know if you have a slide of this but it's LP 29 in our packet it's your uh, a friendly scorecard yes so that last my printout didn't really I couldn't really read what the what the total points are that you have oh, out of the total in. possible points Let's see if I can zoom in <laughs> I don't have my glasses, so that might be tough. Let's see. Oh boy. Yeah. Do so you have 115 out of 219? Correct. So roughly half of what you could have. Okay. And that's that conforms to whatever requirements there are for our town. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more commissioner questions? Yes, Commissioner, you can go ahead. So um, I won't take much of your time. I uh, just want to ask a few questions about the basketball court, uh, LP010, if you could skip to that. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, just want to ask for the, the court, it seems like um, uh, the full circle at the midpoint line. Are you intending for that to actually be the full circle with the uh, surface, the modular polypropylene to be uh, composed of that full circle? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that was the intent of that. Okay. Yes. And what is the surface that's surrounding the basketball court area? Uh, I think that would be um, paved, concrete paving. Okay. And what what's the the um, the texture like of the the court uh, intended court surface area? Uh, it it has a little bit of a, a tooth to it, but oh. um, you know not it's not completely rough. Okay. Uh, sort of like a, a light sandblast finish on concrete. Okay, gotcha. The reason I want to well, I want to ask about that is um, when folks start playing um, and say there's like a light drizzle or something, and somebody makes a hard cut around that area. The, the difference in the footing of the concrete versus whatever the surface area is might have people slip and fall or injure themselves. So that's what's concerned about having that full cord as opposed to having a, just a hard line as at a half circle in between. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, that's a that's a great comment. Okay, um, but I'll I would also like defer if the basketball players on this commission have any objections to that commissioners Guerrero, Barrera and Guerrero. Um, to that suggestion. <laughs> I have a, a few comments about the basketball court, but I wanted to hear from okay. the rest gotcha. of the, the commission. Um, and just last set of questions uh, about the trees behind the court. So those are the pine, the the, the where is it? the myrtle and the southern live oak. 
I believe. Correct. Um, let me pull that up. Oops. Right. So it, it is the Southern Live Oak, and then there's some, <coughs> some crepe myrtles in there. That's yeah. correct. Okay. So how tall do those trees get? Do you know? Uh, crepe myrtle, um, 25 feet okay. roughly, and then the Southern Live Oak is is larger. Great. It's okay. Tree. Are they deciduous trees as well? Um, you know, you asked me really fast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the crepe myrtle, deciduous, okay. southern live oak. Um, Decidu no. Okay. So the Ever, live oak. Evergreen. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Taking the the, the audience comments around trees at their the, word. The arborist. <laughs> they're they're not deciduous. Okay. I'm just asking about that just uh, because it's facing the hoop. Um, when they are playing in late afternoon, especially during the winter, just guarding, you know, sun doesn't get in people's eyes since most people will be facing that way playing basketball. Right, right. Um, for the myrtle, which is not, which which is deciduous, do you know if like the branches tend to be, you know, close together, saturated in any way? I mean, I, I don't. I think what you're asking is 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 it going to block out the sun? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't think it's going to totally block it out, but it is going to it's going to filter in. Okay. Um, but I, I think it's a, a good comment, and we can certainly look at, you know, the the orientation of that. Okay, great. That would be appreciated, as well, as well as a modification. I think the, the full circle to a half circle, for my concerns. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Barrera, I'd just like to uh, make a comment, which I forgot to mention in my presentation. In the audience, we do have Molly Batchelder. She's our city uh, arborist. So if there are any questions regarding trees, removal, or the planting of trees, the plans have been uh, looked by her. So if you have any further clarifications, uh, she's here to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, are there any more commissioner questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Banta. Sorry, I got a couple more questions. Um, LP008. So the, I see item seven, the uh, sculpture focal element. That's a great thing, brilliant idea. I think that uh, you might want to consider moving it out into the sun a little bit more so that it does not uh, get shaded by those trees. I don't know if that is of interest to you or if that is going to adversely impact the uh, lawn area or not, but it's something that you might want to consider. And then um, yeah. LP 10, 010. Oh, hang on just a sec. Uh, Go ahead. We Andrea. haven't had the public hearing yet, and so comment should really be saved for after. Or I should have uh, posed that as a question then. I guess my question is, are you happy with where that is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be happy to study it. Yes. That's okay. Thank you. So my next question, my next question is for LP10. The the sports court, the uh, basketball court there, that blue color is that? I've never seen that on a basketball court. Is that uh, something that's like the latest thing, or is that <laughs> a color that you guys are definitely going to be going with, or how does that work? Uh, I, I'm, I don't know if it's the latest thing. Um, it's just something that we we liked because it was visually offset from the surrounding area. So the blue just kind of had a little pop to it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. No more questions? I actually have a couple of questions. Um, one is, since we're on the basketball court, does Lennar have any other projects that have basketball courts? None that we've built. Okay. Yeah. Um, my next question is about the historical interpretive information plaque. I was wondering if you can please give us a little bit more information about what that's going to be, where those are going to be located, um, and what kind of information is going to go on them? Uh, good question. And actually, there's a condition of approval around that that we had worked with on with staff. So we have not developed exactly what the, the verbiage is. But uh, we, we, it has come to our understanding that it is a resident historian expert that, who is seated here, Mr. Bryant, who, is, who has ultimate authority in approving the language that will go on these plaques. Um, and, but Jim can show you kind of where we're, we're thinking about placing them. So those do show up on the, um, the site amenities diagram. Uh, 
it's sometimes difficult to see, but it's the HP, uh, and so that's sort of the proposed locations of those plaques. Uh, what are they going to look like? Because uh, these look like they're on the ground, but then it says that there's, um, I thought I saw, oh yeah, it says pedestal mounted in parentheses. Right, there'd be some sort of metal plaque that's mounted on a, on a pedestal. Okay. All right, any more questions? I have one, a couple questions. Okay. Um, okay, uh, my questions relate to the basketball court as well. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned um, that you had some feedback from the Park and Rec Committee about the pros and cons. Um, so I'm interested in hearing what the cons were that were presented to you at that meeting, um, as well as um, cons that you have learned along the way. Sure, I, and I think it really comes down to kind of allocation of space and overall kind of flexibility of use and multi-purpose use. And so ultimately, when you know, when we were talking about kind of what are activities to you, you know, what are what are things that the city of Emerald uh, would like to have within this park? Kind of the overarching theme was about, you know, we would like it to be as kind of optional and. Uh, you know, have as much kind of varied uses as, as possible. So it's not kind of dedicated to one thing. Cause like for instance, uh, the, uh, the tennis court came up, you know, tennis courts came up during the citywide meeting, but then they said, well, you know, that's four people on a very large kind of uh, large tennis court surface with fencing. Uh, you know, ultimately if people aren't playing tennis, most people aren't gonna go in there and use it for anything else. And you know, space is at such a premium we're not sure that's really what we want from a community standpoint. And so kind of, it was that same mindset of like when it came to basketball, it was like, okay, well, full court, you know, that's, it takes up a lot of real estate. It's, it's a lot of uh, uh, hard surface uh, that, that we're introducing into that area. And so ultimately is the, the benefits versus kind of some of the drawbacks, you know, what the community would like to see. And so ultimately, you know, through the discussions, it was more about the half court use than kind of, you know, that's gonna get more usage than, you know, full full court games being played and kind of the space that it takes up. So really that's kind of how, how we got to where we're at. Um, and that was in, so the driving kind of uh, motivation or just the, the driving feedback was just more about making sure that we can kind of maximize the each, you know, as much square footage within the open space and parks areas as we could for people to do, you know, uh, what they enjoy the most. Thank you. Um, and a follow-up question to that, um, in terms of the, um, the orientation, um, if, it, if it were to be uh, moved in a different direction, because I agree with the lighting and the sun um, the glaring in on you when you're playing with the orientation now, um, if it were to be changed to horizontal, look, um, horizontally, um, would there be enough space there without protruding into the open space to the left of that? Well, I think, rotated. yeah, I think it'd probably just be rotated so that the goal is, is this way, so your back is to the sun mm -hmm. uh, and you're shooting away from the sun. Mm -hmm. And I think that the thing, I guess maybe the, the thing to keep in mind is like with the half court, it's a square, so it can easily, is that right, right Jim? You right. can just, yeah. you can kind of yeah. turn it pretty right. easily. Thank you. I have one more question. Can you turn it to page LP005? <clears throat> Can you kind of just visually show us the footprint of a full-size court if it remained in that area? Yeah. Just, I mean, yeah, just I, you can even just wave the mouse around or turn the projector on. And yeah, so we thought we might be asked this question. So <laughs> in preparation of... That's what it would look like. And so ultimately, as you can, can you see... Can you zoom out? I'll zoom out, yeah, sure. And to see it in a bigger context. Okay. So, I mean, so that's your, your full court right there. And so kind of the constraints or the drawbacks of this layout, as you can see, is that that full court ends up getting kind of pushed right up against the greenway. And so <clears throat> the thought is, is that, you know, that's a lot of uh, uh, paved surface in that whole area. And it kind of just changes the uh, the whole kind of feel of that space to in the way that we, we feel about it. And kind of having that, you know, basketball next to the greenways, people riding their bikes and the ball rolls out or, or whatever. 
because uh, ultimately we don't think putting a fence up against that greenway would be very um, inviting and, and uh, would be helpful in kind of maximizing flexible use of that space. Would it be possible to shift the court east and put that landscaping on the other side in between the court and the greenway? Well, so what happens is we did not, you know, from a building interface standpoint, we did, you know, pushing that court closer is because we do have residential units that are located down that ground floor, which you'll see in the, in the building FDP. Um, and so having, being that close to somebody's kind of front door and their, their uh, patio space, we just did not feel comfortable kind of pushing that court down that way and so yeah so again it just comes into the it's a big footprint and so it kind of gets a little unwieldy unless you really want to start eating into some of that open lawn area you know that's over where that sculpture area is okay thank you sure okay if there are no more commissioner com uh, questions i will open it up to public comments Public hearing. Uh, public hearing. <laughs> um, so anyone wishing to speak, please sign um, the clipboard. And you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Jack Pizzani, a resident at 1500 Park Avenue and a member of PARC, the Park Avenue Residents Committee. Uh, PARC approves of Lennar's plan for the open space. And we think this is a great opportunity for the whole city to have a large open space to gather in and to enjoy. Currently, we don't have any large open spaces in Emeryville, and we don't see any other opportunities coming down the road for another space like this. A few years ago, with a different developer, the plan was for some buildings gathered around a wide oval roadway with a large median in the middle. The median wasn't something you would really call a great park, and the chopped up bits of land around the buildings weren't a promising park space either. When Lennar got involved, they hosted a number of open events at ECCL, inviting the whole city to provide feedback on what they would like to see in a park. One theme that came up repeatedly was the idea of a large open space, and people said, that's something we don't have. By moving the planned buildings around, Lennar consolidated small open spaces into a much larger one, the one you see in the current plan. We feel that this is a great improvement. Now we have a plan for an open and truly flexible space that can accommodate everything from solitary visitors to large community events. Good public spaces can really pull people together and they add to and strengthen a community. Done well, a public space can be a large part of what makes people really love a place. In this case, that place would be Emeryville. Park feels that having at least one large open space in Emeryville is extremely important, and having that space next to a greenway near, with nearby public transportation, a bike share station, really adds to its appeal and ties it deeper into the social fabric of our city. This is the rare opportunity to have a very special park for the whole city to enjoy. Park is excited about this plan, and we support it, and we hope you do as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any more members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, I guess next up is uh, Commissioner Deliberation. Okay. Do I have to bang this for that part? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Commissioner Deliberation, does anybody have any uh, comments would like to start us off? Well, since I'm on the end here and you're looking this way, I'll start. <clears throat> um, I definitely appreciate everything everyone has done on this project. I think we're finally getting to a point where we've reached consensus as much as we're going to get. And a lot of hard work has been done, and I think we have a really, really good project. Um, I don't see any substantive things that I would like to change uh, on the project going forward. Uh, my thoughts on the basketball court is um, seeing um, what we have to work with and um, I also came to mind, I bike through coming to and from work every day, and I think our community forgets about San Pablo Park. It's a Berkeley Park, but it is really close to Emeryville. It has two full-size basketball courts and numbers, several uh, um, tennis courts. So I think it's a park that our community could use a little bit more um, because it is in a neighboring city and very close, and I know there are at least two full courts there. Um, 
I understand the need and desire for one. I think what I would like to do is I support this half court with the idea, and there's nothing we could do regarding this project, but I think in the next park that the city develops, we look at a full court basketball court in that, because I'm thinking we're looking at maybe a bigger park at that point in time. But I appreciate their efforts of showing us. I think that the full court, because of its relation to the buildings, is kind of problematic, because you know bas basketballs are little noisy uh, people get a little rowdy out there um, so I think and, and as long as this is a regulation size and I think turning that you know 90 degrees um, to the north I think helps solve the one problem that was there so is it a perfect situation I don't think so but I think is as much as a court would be used I think this is functional and usable so um, other than that I like everything I'm ready to go okay Does anybody want to go next I can go Sarah? next okay Okay, um, I too am really excited about this project um, and appreciate the compromise made um, to modify the basketball court. Um, I also appreciate the feedback from the community um, about the space and um, their feedback about the basketball court. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, um, I, I do see this as a opportunity for us to explore other options and future plans also. Um, and um, I'm glad that we're um, seeing some energy and excitement about the idea here on, on the Planning Commission. Um, and so uh, we'd like to explore that in the future for um, potential planning ideas. <coughs> um, uh, I, I don't have any feedback about the, um, the plans that, uh, and any changes I see that need to be made. Um, we, and going back to the questions about the benches, um, and trash cans and street furniture. Um, some feedback I do have about the benches is that um, while that is the um, city, um, like that fits the city guidelines, um, every time I try to sit on a bench here in the city um, that looks just like that, I have to um, clean it up um, because it's full of cobwebs. So I feel like these benches really attract um, spiders um, and a way for them to, I mean, I, I can, I, every Park Avenue, if you try to sit on those benches, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and the same goes for the one just right beneath um, where we live um, by um, the larger building on Christie Avenue. Um, so um, th I'm curious about whether that would be um, um, maintained by the city or by Lennar, um, but definitely have some concerns about the benches um, because of that one reason. Um, I too am ready to go and just wanted to put that to um, two pieces there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I support the project. I think the applicant has done a great job at uh, soliciting input from the community and from and uh, listen to all the voices, staff and commissioners and community. And uh, they've really created a lot of really very nice uh, elements in this open space project. I have to say that uh, I think you guys lucked out that I wasn't here at the last meeting um, because, the, again, the images that you showed for, at the early, all those concept things, I, I would have been inclined to hold you closer to uh, achieving a number of the benefits that those images seem to be offering. but. Nonetheless, you have an excellent plan here, and uh, I am supportive of it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Thompson? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I too really appreciate um, both the community work as well as the applicants' work. Um, I do think the plan has come together well. Um, I, I think in terms of the basketball court, uh, I like the regulation size. I think that's an improvement. Um, I also would support the change in orientation. Um, I also do like the emphasis on that green space and not taking away or, or trying to compete with that green space. Um, so I think the court at, at its size is a good size. Um, and I would say in general, I think you've addressed a lot of the, the issues quite well. Um, I think the, the uh, only concern I had, I really like the fact that you actually showed building entrances and then the bike racks where they were. Um, and I think that you have put a lot in some very active spaces, but I'd say at the at the eastern, or I'm sorry, northern end, um, it, they seem a little thin. But um, that's a very minor uh, thing, and I think overall it's a, an excellent plan. So thank you, I support it. Uh, just reiterating the, the basis of my two sets of questions from earlier on, uh, just uh, again echoing the, my fellow commissioners in terms of changing the orientation slightly so to uh, get the sun off of, uh, out of uh, 
the people using the cord out of their eyes. Uh, and just changing the, the surface uh, from a full circle to a half circle for consistent footing and safety. Other than that, uh, great job. Uh, let's get this built. All right, thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you for a lovely project and for working so closely with the community. I do see a lot of the things that um, a lot of the community members, including Park and folks at the workshops, um, that you know, the things that they brought up are incorporated in this plan. Although I don't personally agree with a lot of the arguments for the basketball court, I was at some of those workshops and I have read the the letters that Park sent out and um, you know reviewing the um, information about the Parks and Rec Committee um, you know I support the half basketball court because it does seem to be the what the community at large prefers um, so I'm also ready to move forward with this project and thank you again so, so we need a motion and a second it, Anybody? I'd be happy to make a motion that we yeah. approve. And I'll make a second. <clears throat> so uh, that's Commissioner Keller and uh, Commissioner Thompson. Um, would that motion include turning the uh, basketball court 90 degrees? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. We want to turn that 90 degrees to the north. Okay. Well, approximately 90 yeah. degrees. You want to. Yeah. You want it oriented. Uh, 90 north. degrees to the right, as if you're facing oh, it from. All right. <laughs> approximately. Right, we'll get to that. <clears throat> uh, so that I would suggest that we add a condition under uh, design. Where is it? So just add a condition under uh, Roman numeral 5A, design conditions and site standards prior to issuance of a grading building permit to the applicant for the property. Uh, currently in that section there are 14 conditions so we would add number 15 that says that the orientation of the basketball court shall be rotated uh, what clockwise 90 approximately degrees, 90 yeah. degrees um, I w so is the seconder okay with that condition uh, I would also like to ask the Commission how you feel about the removal of the two hackberry trees there is part of your approval includes a tree removal permit for those two trees I, I had thought of that and I, I missed that um, I, I always ag agree and feel that saving existing trees is really important they've already been established they're growing in this particular case they're not very healthy and that one is not going to get any more healthy the soil there was never uh, provided to create growth for trees what we're doing now with engineered soils is so much better <clears throat> if we replace those trees i could almost guarantee in a matter of three to five years you're gonna have a tree bigger and healthier than that one that's there and because along with that it is consistent with the rest of the trees we're going to be tearing up the sidewalks <laughs> there anyway which could probably damage the roots of the trees that are there so with that said i I support removing and replacing the trees. And I, I would the same, and because of the health of the trees. Mm -hmm. If if um, if that's if you feel that way, you don't need to modify any of the conditions because that's already in there. Okay. Oh. All right. You ready for a, a vote? Yes. All right. So this is for approval uh, as conditioned, with the modification of an additional condition about rotating the basketball court. Commissioner uh, Banta? Aye. Commissioner Guerrero? Aye. Commissioner Kang? Aye. Commissioner Keller? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. And Vice Chair Barrera? Aye. Six ayes. The application is approved. This decision may be appealed to the City Council within 15 days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen it there, but there's a Strawberry Creek Park. Yes. Which I've seen them there. I tell you, I about fell off my bike. Me too. I actually stopped and photographed them. They were so, it was really dusty, and I got these blurry photographs of these guys. They are so, I haven't seen them in a long time. Whoops. But I never, I've never seen it until I passed through that quick break. Yeah, it was at St. Pablo. Was it St. Pablo? I think we'll do that. Yeah. I think we will take a five minute break and resume at yeah, 10 to 8. I used to, that's
samples. It's really ornate. It's got oh, never mind. I got just areas inside that. She's gone. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Um, thank you very much. We have a study. We have two study sessions on the agenda. The first one is the Ocean View Townhomes. Navarre, care to present? Okay. That would be great. Good evening, Commission. Thank you. This I'll be presenting this evening on the Ocean View Townhomes at 1270 Ocean Avenue. Uh, here is an overview of neighborhood. <laughs> There is Ocean Avenue here, and this is Peabody Lane to the back, which is a private access road. Doyle Street over here to the east, and, oops, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Vallejo. <laughs> and then we have Doyle over here. That was a pop quiz. <laughs> For you. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> All right, so project overview. There's an existing one-story single uh, family home there, and the proposal is to demolish that, and, as well as existing uh, accessory structures there, and build three new multi-bedroom townhomes. Here's some existing site photos for this. And here's what's proposed. This is a color uh, elevation from Ocean Avenue side. This would be from west, so uh, neighbor's view there east side and then from the rear of the property so this is the north side along Peabody Lane. So project history the application was originally filed in May of 2016 for four units uh, instead of three. It came to the Planning Commission for a study session January of 2017 and the feedback for both the community uh, present as well as the Commission at that time was the project was too large and out of character with the neighborhood. The applicant in April held a community meeting um, where they showed a redesigned project with three units and moving the driveway from uh, the west side to, uh, wait, sorry, from the east side to the west side of the project to address some of the neighborhood's uh, concerns. And the neighbors were generally supportive of the redesigned project and found that it better suited the neighborhood. 
staff's feedback was that the driveway was actually not feasible because it was showing 90 degree angles turning into the uh, garages and so there was not enough room to back in and out of the driveway. So uh, staff suggested relocating the parking to Peabody instead of having the driveway access from Ocean. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along tonight. So up at the top is the original proposal that uh, last came to Planning Commission, and then below is the proposal uh, today. So you have the neighboring buildings on either side. You can see that the applicant has uh, reduced the volume of the building in response uh, to the feedback. And also tried to set it back a little bit. So Ocean Avenue, whoa, -ho, a little sensitive here tonight with the equipment. I'm going to try that again. So and this would be the Ocean Avenue side here, and it steps back to the three stories only in the middle. And then same from Peabody, it stepped back. So the bulk where it's the tallest part of the building is in the middle of the lot. So changes since uh, this has last come to the Planning Commission. In summary, it's been reduced from four to three units. The design and the materials of the project have been modified before. It was kind of inspired by a Spanish revival, and now it's a little more craftsman inspired uh, with more wood. Uh, the driveway, as I mentioned, has uh, been removed uh, from access from ocean. So that also means that there is no need for a tree removal permit, which before because the location of the two trees in front, wherever you put a driveway, you would have to get a street tree removal permit. So that's uh, not necessary with the current design. So all parking has been relocate, relocated to the back to Peabody Lane, and the building has been stepped back, as I just mentioned. And the applicant is also, they're not required to provide a family friendly, this is fewer than 10 units, uh, but they have incorporated family friendly features into the design. So here we have a, a picture, this is from 2016 from Google, and then the proposed uh, elevation as well there. So for the general plan, this is considered an area of stability. This land use classification is medium density residential and uh, multi-unit residential is conditionally permitted in this area. And it's also part of the North Hollis overlay zone, which does not modify the permitted uses. So here's that area of stability map from the general plan. And uh, there's this little red circle, if you can see it, and it's right on the edge there between area of stability and potential change. And then for the medium density residential, it's the lighter color yellow, again, right on the edge of medium high density behind it. And then here we are in the North Hollis overlay district. So for the zoning districts, it's in the medium density residential, consistent with the general plan, and in the North Hollis overlay. For the zoning, the base FAR is 0.5, and with a bonus, it can go up to 1.0. It does this project, as proposed, does require a bonus because it's 0.92 FAR. For residential density, at 20 units per acre, which is a base, you can have up to three units, which is what the applicant is proposing. So the density of the units does not uh, require a bonus. And the building height, there's no bonus available. The proposed building height is at the maximum of 30 feet. So bonus points are not required in the RM district but required findings for exceeding the best F for the base FAR or neighborhood compatibility with scale materials and designing to minimize the appearance of driveways, parking spaces, and garage doors. So for the auto parking, the estimated ban is one space per unit, so three spaces, and that's what's proposed, three covered spaces. And the location of the parking, like as I mentioned, is along Peabody Lane. So this is compatible with the design guidelines, which uh, aim for the least visual impact. The only public street here is Ocean Avenue, so it's a unique situation. We don't have many private access. I don't think any other uh, situation like this in the city that I can think of. So it retains 100% active non-parking related uses along Ocean. And it also prevents removal, as I mentioned before, of two existing street trees. The bicycle parking uh, is required one long-term space per unit, and long-term spaces are really meant for the residents there as opposed to short-term, which would be for visitors, someone stopping by or making a delivery. Um, short-term is not required, but the applicant is also proposing uh, two bicycle racks with the capacity of four bicycles next to their common open space. For setbacks, the side and front back set, the front, <laughs> side and front setback requirements are met. The rear setback uh, requires a variance because of the location of the parking garage along Peabody. So you can have garages and accessory buildings in a rear setback, but they're not supposed to exceed 10 feet in height or 20 feet in width unless you get a variance. So 
uh, to accommodate a three-car garage and have it uh, be high enough and also have a little roof deck available in the center portion of that, uh, the design of it requires a variance. So variance findings are uh, for special circumstance. This is at the rear property access via private road. And the other properties along Peabody Lane have garages and pedestrian gates. So this is not uh, a request for something completely unique, although the circumstance itself is unique. So open space, all the open space requirements uh, are exceeded for common open space by uh, twice as much. In the private open space, there's uh, at least one open space for each unit. The rear unit facing Peabody has two open spaces, uh, two separate decks. And landscaping needs to be at least 10% of the site area. That's a requirement of our code. And uh, that's exceeded by uh, almost twice as much. For the North Hollis overlay zone, uh, building massing and treatment is supposed to be scaled and treated in a way that is compatible with adjacent existing structures. And so projects east of Doyle Street are supposed to uh, fit in with the predominant fabric of single family duplexes, it should be respected. New development should provide a horizontal and vertical articulation and <laughs> sloping and gabled uh, roofs, which this project has. Um, are encouraged and complementary and traditional building materials, including wood and masonry, are encouraged as well under the North Hollis plan. So here's a uh, proposed elevation along Ocean. And what uh, this uh, rendering is trying to show is the step back in the building. And here's from the rear of the property along Peabody Lane. So as you can see, both of the adjacent properties already have uh, garages and decks on top of the garage in one case as well. So Peabody Lane, um, there's plenty of space to turn into the uh, uh, proposed garage areas here. And there's also a proposed uh, pedestrian access gate here as well. And for parking, so Ocean is over here on the right, Peabody's over here on the left. The green spaces show the, the uh, vehicular, the car parking areas, and the blue, uh, the areas where uh, uh, bike racks can be hung so they can hang. And then we have the two bike, guest bike parking spaces in front of this unit here. The common open space is located directly next to it. And trash compost recycling has been incorporated into the project also. So there is some feedback from the neighborhood, some concerns about people rifling through uh, garbage and recycling trash it being problematic. So this is uh, proposed to be secured uh, structure at the front of the property. So it's a direct short path from the enclosure to Ocean Avenue. And for landscaping, um, this is showing some of the hardscape with permeable surfaces and the entrances to the middle and rear unit along this path. And then for the front unit, it's a, a sloped access, so it can be an accessible unit. And this is the um, common open, I mean, pardon me, not common open space, it's a private open space for the front unit. And speaking of that open space, we have the uh, common, that, I mean private, wow, it's really difficult, private here. Uh, to the east of that pathway. And then we have the common along the common path along the other side. And then there's also um, the roof decks that I mentioned. So the rear unit has two roof decks, the one on top of the center. Here is on the second floor and then the third floor one uh, to the east. So the first floor plans uh, show uh, dining areas and common living spaces and uh, half baths or full baths in this case uh, for all units and then the second floor plans are the bulk of the bedrooms and then the two of the units have third floors with master suites in the decks that I mentioned before. The applicant also incorporated as I mentioned before family friendly features so some of these would be areas such as place to take off your shoes and have storage by a front door, um, having common pantry areas, uh, dining rooms where everyone can sit around the table, uh, these are all features that are included in the family-friendly design guidelines. And uh, open spaces accessible easily to the family. And additional open space here. So this project requires a development as a bonus, as I mentioned, because of going over the base FAR. So findings would be need, need to be made for that. Uh, conditional use permit findings are required. Uh, demolition of residential structure. So because there's a demolition of an existing residential structure, this would require 
Planning Commission recommendation and City Council approval. So uh, after tonight's meeting, the next step will be to go to City Council for a study session, back here for recommendation, and then back to City Council for approval. And variance findings, uh, there's a set of six findings that are required for the variance that I uh, kind of briefly walked through. Uh, it has to be consistent with the general plan. There's special circumstances <coughs> unique to this area or this property, which we discussed with Peabody Lane being a unique circumstance. Um, and that uh, it's not providing like an extra benefit to the <coughs> applicant. So. And it would also be material detrimental or to public health, safety, or welfare to the neighbors. It also, of course, requires design review findings. Um, staff comments. So this originally went to DCC. Well, not originally, but af since it's last been here, it went to DCC in July. Uh, that's our interdepartmental staff meeting. So there were uh, some feedback about needing more dimensional information, more details, and elevations with dimensions of neighboring buildings. The applicant addressed all of those comments. Uh, it was noted by staff that a curb gutter and sidewalk replacement would be needed along the Ocean Avenue side, and that uh, there's actually a light pole on the Peabody Lane side with a guide wire that would need to be relocated and replaced. And um, it's not a huge issue. It just needs to be moved a little bit so it can make that those uh, garages uh, feasible. Could you repeat what you said about the ocean? Is yeah, that? so a really common um, condition of approval is replacing what we call curb gutter sidewalk. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so there was actually some sidewalk work done there as part of a large sidewalk rehabilitation program across the city, but because of new sewer and uh, addressing some things on the curb that haven't been addressed, the uh, project would need to be redone. Thank you. So issue for the commission to, issues to be considered tonight by the commission are does the commission have any feedback regarding the design of the overall project, landscaping, or unit design? And does the commission feel that the applicant has adequately addressed previous comments from the neighbors and the commission? Is it a better fit with the neighborhood, the design guidelines, and the North Hollis plan? And does the commission feel that all the required findings can be made? The applicant is here tonight and would like to address the commission and both of us are available for any questions or comments. Are there any questions for Navarre? Navarre, I just have the one question. I like the idea of the garages along Peabody Lane, and I know it's a private street, and I don't know if it's just my wishful thinking, but I thought there was a time when the city was trying to acquire that and make it a public street, or is it always? So is the easement in perpetuity, or, you know, it has an easement on private private, so it is in, I'm getting a yes from the, yeah. the applicant, so it is in, okay. So it's not something that will go away, and then all of a sudden this place has no parking. Okay. Correct. They do have an easement. <clears throat> I have just a question. Um, on the west elevation, it shows that there's grid on grids on the windows, and I was wondering if those are simulated divided lights, if they're true grids, if they are grids between the panes of glass, or if you guys are even at that point where you know you're going to have grids on those windows. I'm just trying to get to the elevation. There we mm -hmm. go. Um, so that hasn't been specified yet, but we can absolutely okay. put that in the conditions. Great. Thank you. Question? Yeah, um, Navarre, on sheet A 2.0. Hold on one moment. Yeah. Sorry, A 2.0. So can you shift that so we see the first unit in the street? Yeah. Okay. Would you like me to zoom in on that first unit no, in the no, street? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so my question to you is, it, it, are all the first floors of the units at the same level, do you, as far as you know? There is a, a slight grade variation at the site, and I believe some grading would need to be done as part of this project. The but the first unit, uh, that accessible path is gonna have to have a slope on it. So is the first unit mean that there's no steps, that it's a fully ADA accessible unit? 
Uh, my understanding is not ADA compliance, but it's accessibility compliance for residential. So, um, but yeah, so they would ha one unit does have to meet accessibility standards, and that would be the unit. So that unit has no front steps uh, at the at the front door uh, landing. Is that correct? That's and, correct. But the other units have, it looks like, I can't quite tell, you have at least one, two, three, four, four steps at each unit, is that right? Each yes. step is seven inches or something? Um, maybe the applicant can come up and Sorry. address these. <laughs> um, yes, the other units do have, a, um, there is a great difference between Peabody and Ocean, but the other units have approximately three or four steps going up to the finished floor. However, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm a little bit froggy. Um, part of our design session was that we were still receiving feedback on our bin storage. Um, so we're hoping to redefine um, our accessible path of travel for that unit um, in our next session as we have some changes we also need to make to the bin storage Cause, area. Because the steps, the number of steps you have there, does it indicate a a two-foot difference between, uh, well, I don't know, yeah, between the, the street yeah. and that fr second 18 unit? 18 inches to 24 inches. <clears throat> okay. And then on the same sheet there, you, on the uh, east side, in the setback area, you show water heater in three positions? Yes. And what is that exactly? <laughs> um, it, was in, it was in response to um, some of my communications with the neighbors. They had concerns about where if there would be outdoor air conditioners or heaters or water heater units and they asked me to note those so they would know apparently there was another neighbor down the street that had an outdoor unit that was loud so the water heaters are instantaneous water heaters tankless and are noted in that side yard um, so for location they, purposes for are, each unit are they at the ground level or are they on the hanging on the side They're of the... They're hanging on the side about three feet off the ground. They appear in that elevation on that side, um, which I can tell you the sheet number in just a sec. Um, I think it's A4.1. They're visible on 7.2 as well. They're on 7.2. Oh, sorry, 8.4.2. Yeah. I apologize. They're, They're also on 7.2. Yeah. And Navarre, is that, uh, what is the setback at that elevation so by, what is, what is the required setback? The required setback is three feet. I believe it's about five feet. We made it five feet for fire. Got it. Assembly purposes. Okay, great. Um, I got a couple other questions since you're up at okay. the podium there, if that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, on sheet A2.2, you show the, uh, the, uh, Paving, paving plan, landscape schedule for your pavings? Yes. Um, there's an image, a photographic image at the top. Mm -hmm. They're second from the left, and it shows a uh, snowcrete pavers, pervious snowcrete pavers. Yes, and is that is that what you're planning on? And all the all the gridded uh, green areas that you have there, yes. is that the treatment you're planning on there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, next question is in the plans. In sheet A three point zero. Um, so you. Sh Let's see, that's the upper floor. That's, I think, 3.2 maybe. Do you have 3.0, Navarre? 3.0 is the first floor. Yeah. Okay. So th the plans show uh, washer dryer cabinets in the unit two and unit three. Correct. W we, were those going to be stacked washer dryers? Is that what you had in mind? or? Um, side by think, side. I don't think we've really determined that yet, but okay. they're it's a detail. sized for side by sides in unit one. I'm sorry, unit three and unit two. Right. And unit one um, was going to be was going to be stacked. So the unit one, where would that lawn, where would that be in, um, in the plan? It's currently located um, next to the coat closet. Okay. So maybe it needs to be a little deeper. Okay. That's, and then here's just a question I had. You, you have a closet under the stairs that says FAU. What does that stand for? 
Sorry, um, heating forced air unit. It means what? I'm sorry, a heating fo a heater, a forced air unit. Oh, forced air heater. unit. Okay, mm -hmm. great. <coughs> Thank you. I was wondering about that too. Is that a lot? Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Um, hold on. Yes, I have one more question. Sure. Sheet A7.2. You have a very nice treatment on your other elevations of two different materials on each elevation, where you have a, I guess, a board and bat on the upper elevation. Mm -hmm. But on this one, uh, which shows the decks, I think, on the upper elevation. That's correct. And then the uh, the dormer behind. Yes. That that you've chosen to put in uh, shingles there. We did go back and forth with whether or not that should continue the kind of pattern language of being board and bat for the um, for that upper. Dormer, so we, we actually have another rendering that shows that, um, which I'd be happy to send to you if you wanted to see that as a study. Um, it would be great to see it. I'll, I'll reserve any sure. more observations on it until the. Appropriate um, we went time. with we went with the shingle in the end um, because we felt that it didn't keeping the shingles um, didn't emphasize the dormer on that side, and we were trying to make it blend backwards. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the applicant or for Navarra? No. Okay. One more question. <clears throat> um, are the dormers on the on the west elevation required to get the um, required ce ceiling height on the third floor? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, ceiling, ceiling height and egress, essentially. Oh, I got another question. Yeah. Um, Navar gave such a thorough presentation, and we've kind of skipped over mine at this point. So I just, I also just wanted to take a brief moment and thank the staff and community and all the neighbors for all of their support and working with us and um, and supporting the project and for their review time. So thank you. Okay, we do have a couple more questions. Okay, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sorry, I've got another question. No, it's okay. Go so A4.0, oh, okay. if you could show that. So in this uh, elevation, you show the uh, garage, the finished ceiling of the garage at 9 foot 9. Correct. I presume that's because that's the same finished ceiling level as the f first floor. Is that correct? That's correct. And the garage, of course, is lower than the That's floor of the first level, so therefore you have a higher garage. Absolutely, area. yeah. The into, um, we are dealing with a slab on grade situation for and the on, garage and a perimeter foundation for right. the. Right. So then, on top of that, you have a uh, a well, a, a, a flat seal, a flat roof. It's going to be angled for drainage. Correct. And then you've got a deck as well. Just in the middle, yes. Just right. for that and unit. the, the, the floor, finished floor level of the deck is shown as that dashed line right there. That's correct. Okay. The, the, finished, flo the finished floor of the habitable space of the unit matches the finished top of deck. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, my question is just on sheet A04, um, showing the three different trash containers is that part of what you're trying to work out with the trash um, enclosure because there's two locations for bins for, for, uh, the existing containers holds two per unit and you're showing the three types of containers right we well we had a lot of trash comments there's a lot of trash concerns on ocean avenue it's bin storage and locations and security so um, at the point where we submitted this design, we are still working with um, Marcy on mm -hmm. feedback. Um, so ultimately, yes, this was some of the issues. Um, essentially, the neighbors originally wanted the bins located in the garages when the garages were located under the units. Um, but at the point the bins were on Peabody, we can't get trash pickup on Peabody, it turns out. So it only occurs on Ocean, and there was questionability, especially if we had a, you know, a family accessible unit in the first unit facing Ocean, if that was really smart design to place garage bins on the opposite end of your lot from your trash pickup. And would they just stay on the street, you know, basically. So we designed the bin enclosure and worked with the community and Suzanne to 
figure out where, where the community would most like to see that bin pickup. It turned out it was next to the street tree, which we are now able to keep. Um, and the bin enclosure was put in for security's sake because there's um, problems with raccoons and people dumping the bins or going through the bins. Um, and then there was some questions as to whether or not in the, in the community, whether or not the, the bins per unit that are required by the city of Emeryville are actually adequate. Um, and should there be like a community bin if you have a community landscape space? Um, so that's, those are the, these, this is the issue that we were working out, which also affected the design of the accessible path of travel off of ocean from unit one. So I will have that resolved and answered for you. Okay. I do have one question. Um, I was looking at uh, page A3.0 mm -hmm. and A4.2, um, and I noticed you dimensioned the unit uh, widths on the 3.0, um, and then A4.2 were not dimensioned, and they didn't look like they were consistent. And so I think the question was, can you dimension them and make sure they're consistent, or, or do you have comments or um, thoughts on? A4.2, and what was the other one? I'm sorry. 3.0. Oh, A3. It's the plan versus sorry. the elevation. Sure. Um, we will make sure they're consistent. I think some of the, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make sure they're consistent. Those dimensions on A4.2 are pulling to the outside edge of the of the patio, I think, for unit one. Um, so we'll provide consistent dimensions that are dimensioning the exact same datums between plan and elevation. Okay, yeah. For and, consistency's and, sake. And particularly unit three, it, you know, it should have three windows and then yeah. your, your split line's over and I'm like a little confused by it. So. Right, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll double check that. They might also just be a graphic okay. error too. Thank one you more question. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, we keep jumping around. That's um, all right. So sheet A2.0 shows that the three parking spaces are all the same size, and it looks from that sheet that they are centered um, in relation to you know the rest of the building. And then in sheet A2.6, it looks like there's a bit more space on the left-hand side of the garage. Is that accurate? Yeah, that portion there where Navarra is pointing. Um, I think we were just looking at the, I, I'll double check. Um, I think the intention is on the plans to have, my intention would be to have the left-hand garage, have it be symmetrical basically. To have it be symmetrical. Also to provide share walls. Okay. <laughs> Three feet of share wall on either side of the Great. corner you. points. Yeah, I think it was just a graphic with the colors. Okay. Was there anything else that we would like to present? I am, I am all done and at your disposal okay. to continue answering questions. <laughs> okay. The, all right. Thank you. Um, this is a study session rather than a public hearing, but if there's anyone from the public who would like to comment on this, please feel free to come up. Seeing no one, we'll bring it back to the uh, commission for discussion. You look like you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on a job well done. Uh, you really listened uh, to us to begin with and then the community and your meetings afterwards. Um, I don't have a problem with mission style. I think it fits in almost any city in California, but I think the arts and crafts rendition of this fits better with the existing neighbors and I think it makes the neighborhood a lot happier. I think the way this has scaled works a lot better. I really appreciate your efforts in the family friendly. It was not something you had to do. Um, and I'm really applauding you <clears throat> for making for sale units. We really do want to see a lot more for sale units in this community. Although those can always end up being rentals, but you know, there's someone that has a vested interest in it. And so I think that's always a good thing. So I really appreciate that. Um, other than that, I think it's a really nice project. I think you need a couple tweaks and we can bring it back for approval. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any comments? Nope. No. Nope. I wasn't here for the first session, but I agree in terms of it fitting more into the neighborhood there. Um, so I, I think the design um, looks great there um, as proposed um, and uh, don't see any major changes to the design piece that, that I'd want to give you input about right now. 
Uh, so I think that, yeah, the progress that you've made and the direction you've gone is excellent. It's really a tremendous improvement, the shifting the cars back to Peabody, the reduction of the number of units, and the, uh, the architectural treatment are all tremendously positive uh, accomplishments. So the only thing that drives me crazy is this uh, upper third level um, where you have on the, I think it's to the, is it to the east or west? It's to the, uh, it's the east elevation where you've got shingles on that upper level, but <laughs> every place else you have the, uh, the board and batten. And uh, it's just, you know, obviously it's a matter of preference, mm -hmm. but just for whatever it's worth, um, I think that to continue that same pattern would be uh, very consistent and kind of make it uh, make the make the architecture of it more more consistent and more uh, comprehensible. Okay. Because I think it's a it's a good good combination. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Would you like? You have sure, I'll, I'll pick up on that actually, right. yeah. because um, I think I, I think I have the same sense that th this elevation is probably the weakest elevation, um, and it's to me um, it may be a question of materiality change, but it's definitely a question of uh, proportioning and the length of everything. That there's no real division, mm -hmm. and the baton may solve that. Okay. Um, but the I think the other side is much more successful because sure. it is more divided and modulated, and you can can kind of see that. So I'd say definitely this, is, this would be the okay. side I would give some attention. But I do think overall the, the project in terms of responding to community uh, comments, in terms of the, the styling and the proportioning, uh, the improvement in parking, I agree with, with everything the commissioners have said. Um, so, and you know, the, th the thing also that I think is really great about your project um, is that it is, it feels much more truly family friendly in terms of the sizing of the rooms, like a family could actually live there. Um, I do think you'll be challenged on the parking um, because I think about a two, two kid family um, and I certainly have a kid and don't have a car. <laughs> um, but I know a lot, of, a lot of my friends have two kids and it becomes a problem for them. So you will have a very select group. Um, and, but I do think that sp space wise you've been very, um, in terms of this being sort of the right proportioning of space, you're, you're putting the space to the living space, not to the parking space. Um, you're really truly trying to do for sale and the house-like units. I think that's all working quite well. So. Um, I'd just like to commend the applicant for doing a great job. I know the, the first set of uh, uh, comments that we had to offer was, uh, couldn't have been easy to hear. So uh, it was really great to see the applicant not just making the improvements um, uh, that were common to commented upon by my colleagues, but also doing it in, in conjunction with the community uh, and really taking their comments to heart. It really shows off. So uh, job well done. Um, everything from design to doing uh, what you didn't have to do, uh, like Commissioner Keller said, in terms of offering these as truly family-friendly units. So job well done and looking forward to the next study session. Okay. I, I share um, all the commissioner's sentiments about this. I think it's a overall um, great design and improvement from the last round and it fits pretty well into the neighborhood. Um, I appreciate the material variation and the trim detail that you put into it. Um, and, and But I do have a couple of suggestions. So sure. um, I agree that this elevation should have a little bit of um, material change and I would support the board and batten on the um, okay. balcony. Um, and I would suggest maybe if it's possible to add some bay windows to break up the elevation a bit, okay. um, similar to what you have on the other side. Uh, and the thing that drives me crazy is um, grids in between the panes of glass in the windows. I think they're cheesy and your, your building is a very beautiful design. Right. Um, and so I would support either going with simulated divided lights or no grids at all um, okay. for the next round. If you see, I normally work in Berkeley, and they yeah they want they require those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, noted. I think I think I think I I would agree with that aesthetic. Um, and let's see what. Oh yes, and about the dormers on the west elevation, um, I was wondering if 
it would be possible to have a little bit of the roof exposed because I think something that looks funny to me on that elevation, if you can turn to um, <coughs> sheet A4.1 or the rendering that has the west <coughs> elevation, either one would work. Oh, there you go. Um, so something that looks funny to me about this elevation is uh -huh. that the dormer goes all the way down to the edge of the um, roof. Okay. <laughs> And usually with the dormers, you see a little bit of that roof exposed sure. between mm -hmm. the edge and the yeah, dormer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that might help with okay. with that. So if um, you know that's possible in the next Absolutely. round, that would be mm -hmm. something good. But uh, and I think that's basically it. So um, thanks again for working with the community and and um, taking all our comments into consideration in this design. It looks really good. Thank you. And I think that uh, we all seem to be on the same page, that you're moving in the right direction, and this is a vast improvement over what was there before, and it's really appreciated that you work with the community. Um, the massing is a lot better than it was, and it's fitting better in the community. I would like to see you work out the landscape plan a little bit better, and um, especially the private space in the front on the east side of the front of the property, how people would access it, and what, you know, a little bit more thought to the treatment of the planting. I agree that the east elevation could use change in materials and change in definition of the units that would make that a lot more interesting. Um, looking at sheet A3.0, um, the only thing that I think strikes me as a little awkward is in unit one. Um, in unit one that the kitchen is, to get from the kitchen to the dining room, you're going through the living room and around the front of the stairs and that, and maybe flipping the dining room and the living room would allow you to have a place where it's more um, comfortable access to that private outdoor space and maybe even having a door there that could lead out into that private space so that that becomes more usable and that the flow of the circulation works better in that unit. Um, I also, I did notice that on the A41 elevation that it was, it, it seemed like the window placements were not lined up with where they were on the plan view. So I'm, when you come back with it more carefully calibrated, that'll be really good. But thank you for your efforts on this. Can I make one, one yes. more comment? So one more comment. <laughs> um, on sheet A2.2, you have the, uh, like this is the landscape or a lands some kind of landscape plan. Okay. And again, we discussed these pavers you showed up there in that photograph. So you, you maybe you were here for the previous uh, applicant, with all those fantastic photographs they showed us. And then, so what, what I would ask you to do is when you come back next time, if, th if this is what you're gonna put in, then that's great, keep it, because I think it looks fantastic. But let's make sure that that is what it is going to go in there and that that is what it's going to look like. Okay. And then the other thing I would do is I would challenge you to, uh, you have a common open area that's right behind the, between the uh, trash and the bicycle storage. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know it's... Others me as well. I don't know. <laughs> well, what I would challenge you is to actually figure out how to make that mm -hmm. into something that's going to be useful or used. Sure. Um, we did... At one point, we did have raised planter beds in that area, but I would, did, but the community open space needs to be open with a bench, and it can't be used as community beds. Is that? I is don't that know. Understanding the bar, because that was received really well by the neighbors. But to do what? Um, the, in the community open space, the neighbors really liked the idea, and it kind of we kind of worked it into like the bin enclosure sort of um, like pattern language of doing three set community garden, garden beds in that, um, in that open space. Is that, can we revisit that? Um, or does it need to be free and clear open? Um, it doesn't have to be free, clear and open. It, there is a required amount of seating and there is a requirement for a tree. Oh, okay. But you could so, have beds there in a common open okay. space. That should be fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll work on that and come back so, to something. So, and speaking of planter beds, the uh, the deck that you have over the garages, <coughs> yes, you have very little room be between the top of the uh, garage uh, curb or the top mm -hmm. of its wall, and the uh, whatever you're going to need for drainage. 
uh, okay. to I'll either cut side. A section and double check. And and I can't quite. I, I think if you're if the surface of your deck is the same level as the height of your mm -hmm. the top of your garage roof, that's going to be a bit of a challenge for you too. So you just might want to work on that and. Uh, you might also consider, you know, the view across the railing of that deck onto those tops of those, what I presume will be uh, built-up roofing material. You might want to put some planters off the uh, railings that uh, offer a kind of a visual buffer against mm -hmm. that. That's a nice idea. Thank you. <coughs> a, c a couple other comments. Um, I just wanted to, to a sort of ask think about the um, green building elements. Um, I, no I noticed that you had solar ready indicated on the dormer um, and, uh, and then the skylight ready. And I wasn't quite sure what skylight ready was. Um, we, had, we had had a different system in our original um, plan that as we worked th through this plan, it w I'm hoping to refine the green building elements a little bit more. Okay. Um, in this, in our original proposal, we had had um, whole house fans that would circulate with these operable skylights um, through these okay. light wells, um, part, in a Gaudi esque but <laughs> technological, technologically functional. Okay. Uh, nod, and that and that was carried through in, in some of the units. Um, I I'll, I can specify those intentions a bit more as they're refined okay. in the next round. Yeah, it'd be great. I mean, it'd mm -hmm. be great to see what you can add here. Yes, um, absolutely. Because I definitely think it's an important element and would be appealing to many families. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did do a we did a solar consult, and um, our intention was also to put EV in the garages, which I'll note on the plans and create dimensions for, and I'll, I'll refine those details okay. for great. next round. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good Thanks job. for your work. Yeah. <coughs> Our second study session is of the update of the city's noise ordinance. Two additional speaker cards. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. This is a study session for the update of uh, the city's noise ordinance. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of a background. Since the adoption of the city's current noise ordinance back in 2003, much of the uh, city's industrial areas have converted to commercial and residential uses. And the city's population over the last 14 years has increased by 54% and new residences have been placed near industrial and commercial facilities, which has resulted in a noticeable increase in the number of complaints submitted uh, to the police department. Because the current noise ordinance does not have a clear objective noise criteria, law enforcement personnel do not have the ability to determine whether a noise exposure levels are in violation of the noise ordinance. To address uh, public concerns, the council, city council held a study session earlier in the year to consider uh, potential amendments to the noise ordinance and provided direction for a noise study. Uh, as part of that, uh, the city hired ESA consultants to do this noise study, and they will be coming and giving you a presentation. But before that, before they do that, I do want to walk the commission through uh, the different sets of existing provisions that are in our books. So the first one is the noise ordinance, and it, uh, it lies in the Municipal Code, Chapter 13, Title 5. It regulates annoying or excessive noise that disturbs any reasonable person of non normal sensitivity. It sets general noise standards for all noise, including construction noise. It establishes a waiver procedure for evening and weekend construction work. It specifies a list of prohibited acts. 
It includes provisions related to leaf blowers, generators, and other loud equipment and loud parties and gatherings. It also establishes penalties for violations, and it declares that violations are deemed uh, public nuisances. It does not establish specific noise limits, uh, i.e. decibel levels that can be measured. The second piece of regulation is regarding connected with noise is the performance standards uh, in the uh, planning regulations. These include provisions related to air quality, light and glare, uh, as well as noise and vibration. Uh, the noise standards set maximum permitted noise levels in decibels for both daytime and nighttime in, uh, in the RM or the medium density residential zone and, and, and in all other zones. So there are two categories, the RM zone and all other zones. Performance standards also stimulate, uh, stipulate when measurements are necessary in the enforcement of these performance standards, they shall be made by careful, by competent, uh, competent professionals in the applicable field in accordance with accepted professional practice. The third piece uh, that is covered by noise is the noise element of the journal plan. <coughs> The, this uh, element contains an assessment of the existing noise sources and levels, and that would be 2003, uh, the, which when, the, uh, when it was established, including freeways and local roads, railroad, airport, industrial uses, construction, and other equipment, uh, as well as projected noise uh, sources and levels. <coughs> as I mentioned, it includes the existing 2005, not three, uh, noise contours and projected future noise contours. It also includes a table of acceptable and unacceptable noise levels for various land uses, as well as city goals and policies related to noise. While these three documents each relate to the regulation of noise, they are used for different purposes. The noise ordinance regulates noise generally, including construction noise, and primarily relates to noises that are short-term and transient, such as loud parties and music. Most noise complaints are violations of the noise ordinance. Performance standards relate to land uses that are permanent and which may have associated equipment and activities that produce noise on an ongoing basis, such as the HVAC system or an equipment. And the general plan noise element primarily relates to the siting of new users to ensure that they're not accepted, uh, exposed to unacceptable levels. So the, so the focus of the current study is on updating the noise ordinance. However, modifications to the ordin ordinance may necessitate uh, companion amendments to the performance standards and or to the general, pl uh, general plan noise element to ensure internal consistency. So the presentation that you'll hear from ESA, uh, it'll begin with some fundamentals of noise, Noise 101. Uh, it'll give you the noise surveys and the results of it. Uh, it will talk, they will talk about objective noise criteria and options, and they will also talk about other suggested updates uh, to the noise ordinance. So with that, I am going to invite uh, Chris uh, Sanchez and Stan uh, to come and give us a presentation. And let me just open up. Uh, <clears throat> just use that to click through? Yeah, or well, you can just use that. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, as long as you speak into the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Maru. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Stan Armstrong. I'm with Environmental Science Associates, and I'll be giving a presentation on um, the proposed updates to the City of Embryo's uh, noise ordinance. Um, I will be discussing, uh, as Maru put it, the uh, uh, fundamentals 101 of noise, uh, the effects of noise <clears throat> on people, and the results of the citywide uh, noise survey. And Chris Sanchez will be covering the objective noise criteria options, uh, su subjected, um, suggested updates to the city of Emeryville's uh, existing noise ordinance, and then we'll be taking some questions and answers. Oh, we'll be taking questions, we'll be, and we'll give you answers. Uh, so to start noise, the basis of noise 101, uh, so it's, a good, it's always good to have a firm understanding of what is sound and what is noise. Um, 
Sound is a vibratory disturbance capable of being detected by ears or equipment. And noise is, <coughs> is defined as sound that is loud, unpleasant, unexpected, undesired. Uh, a good definition would be sound would be something associated to an orchestra and noise would be, you know, construction noise or um, someone banging on your door. Um, metrics commonly used in noise is, uh, well, noise is uh, measured on the decibel scale, zero being the lowest uh, threshold for human hearing, 120 to 140 being a threshold of pain. Uh, since the uh, noise, uh, the human hearing is based on a mid frequency range of 100 uh, kilohertz to 404 kilohertz, um, there's a weighting to the frequencies of sounds, uh, so it's more focused to human hearing, and that's defined as A-weighted. Um, most environmental assessments related to humans is in uh, the form uh, measured in uh, decibels A-weighted. Um, another common metric used in uh, noise studies is the equi uh, energy equivalent sound uh, level, which is average noise exposure over uh, for a given period of time. Another common one, which you'll see uh, throughout uh, our proposed um, updates to noise ordinance and thresholds, is the uh, percentile um, noise levels, which is the noise level exceeded for n percent of a measurement period. Um, for example, L50 would be a noise level exceeded 50% of the time. L10 would be a noise level exceeded 10% 10, um, 10 of the time. Um, another uh, noise metric used commonly in noise is the maximum noise level. This is ins instantaneous maximum noise uh, measured during a period of time that something equivalent to L max that would be measured would be like impact pile driving where you have a sudden uh, impulse or a sudden impact. Uh, another one would be a gunshot. Um, uh, you, you register a high L max. Uh, another one is the day night average sound, um, average sound level, or commonly known as the DNL. DNL. And this is the average um, of the A weighted sound levels during a 24 hour period where night, nighttime noise is, uh, has a uh, 10 decibel weighting. So this is commonly used in your uh, general uh, plan or um, land use compatibility noise standards. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea of what sound sounds like, um, um, a quiet urban night, um, well, I'm sorry, this, this figure gives you an idea of what the noise levels are from zero to 110 decibels. Um, for example, a quiet urban night is equivalent to 40 decibels. Um, like for example, this room, if I stop talking, it, that's 45 decibels. Um, me talking right now is equivalent to about um, 60, 60 decibels or 50 to 60 decibels. Uh, near a lawnmower, uh, if you guys are uh, mowing your lawn and you're pushing your lawnmower, that would be equivalent to 70 decibels. Um, This slide gives you an idea of what a noise increase sounds like or, or how it's measured. A one decibel increase cannot perceive um, by the average human being. For example, if you are exposed to a noise level that's 60 decibels and, uh, and then all of a sudden the noise increases by uh, up to 61 decibels, so one decibel increase, you're not gonna be able to perceive that change in noise. A three decibel change is considered barely perceptible. Um, an example of something that's a uh, three decibel increase would be like if you're in your home and you hear someone talking down the hall or whispering or something like that where it's just barely perceptible. We can't really hear what they're saying, but, uh, but you know it, there's a slight increase in sound. That's a three decibel increase. Um, uh, at least a five decibel increase is considered barely perceptible. Um, it lists, lists um, uh, a noticeable change in human response. Um, that something like this would be like someone starts up the lawn, your neighbor starts up the lawnmower outside your home, and it makes you get out, or it makes you, uh, you know, aware that he's mowing his lawn. Um, and so that's a noticeable change in uh, noise that elicits your response. A 10 decibel increase is uh, subjectively heard as a approximately doubling in loudness. This is something if you're sitting at your desk and you heard someone 
bang on your door or you hear a car wreck outside or someone shoots a gun it, it makes you want to get up and um you know investigate what's going on that, that's considered a 10 decibel increase in noise <clears throat> Um, so in uh, the city council session, as Maru pointed out, in uh, the city council session in February 16th of, of last year, uh, requested uh, um, as part of the such session to understand the existing noise environment within the city of Emeryville. Um, and as part of that curiosity, we, we conducted a uh, citywide noise survey. Um, from October, no, I'm sorry, September 15, 2017 to September uh, 25th of 2017. Uh, the noise survey uh, consisted of a total of 26 noise measurements. Noise measurements were selected based on their proximity of existing noise sources within the city of Enerville. Uh, these, con these noise sources uh, consisted of I-80 uh, traffic, traffic along I-580 and Union Pacific Railroad, as well as surface streets, um, busy surface streets such as Powell Street, 40th Street, and San Pablo Avenue. A noise survey also, survey also covered areas of the city that, um, which um, due to their proximity from these uh, noise sources, uh, have a lower ambient. So for example, uh, the, the community of Watergate and some of the um, um, medium density homes on the southeast side of uh, the city of memory bill. Uh, all noise measurements were conducted using uh, a type one or a type two sound level meter. Uh, noise meters were calibrated before and after uh, each measurement to guarantee the accuracy of the results gathered out in, well, out, out in the field. Um, and um, while the noise meters were uh, running, they were capturing uh, one second uh, LAQs. As I discussed before, an LAQ is the average noise level within a certain period of time. Those noise level, uh, gathered noise levels were uh, used to approximate um, the date nine noise levels and the L percentile um, noise levels at each of the locations during the noise survey, gathered during the noise survey. Um, this is the results of the noise survey uh, for the uh, updating the noise ordinance. Uh, our main concern was with the people with the highest noise levels that the city of uh, citizens of Emmyville were being exposed to. Uh, we chose the L50, and as I discussed before, the L50 is the noise level that succeeded 50% of the time. So that's around about the average, uh, you know, the average noise level experience, uh, measured uh, noise level. Uh, as you can see um, uh, from the table, it shows the daytime and nighttime noise levels. The daytime we, we uh, met, uh, uh, defined as 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. and nighttime from uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, the highest, uh, as you see in the chart, we have the highest L50, uh, the min of the highest measured L50, the average highest L50, and the maximum. And again, these, these uh, uh, noise levels uh, were obtained from the noise measured data, which we um, we grouped up into uh, each respective zoning districts. As you can see, some of the zoning districts don't really have a major change in the daytime and the nighttime. Uh, for example, high uh, uh, density residential has uh, a slight change, only into like two decibels between um, the nighttime and daytime. And the same uh, goes with some of um, um, uh, you know, the mixed use residential uh, zoning areas. The main reason for these, the, n uh, not a uh, major change in daytime, nighttime is their proximity to noise sources that are constant throughout the day and night. That includes traffic along I-80, uh, freeway traffic along I-580, and railroad activity along Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, since uh, n noise in the city of Emory are mainly concentrated more inland, um, where uh, there's more 
arterial roadways and um, um, busy streets and um, and and then where the ambient's higher, um, noise levels were found to be quite noticeably lower the further you get into the bay, away from these noise sources. We experienced this low ambient. Uh, observe, we noticed that low ambient in, a, in the community of Watergate. Uh, since the Watergate is zoned as um, medium high residential uh, and didn't really fit the ambient that we're measuring for that particular zoning district, um, we decided uh, we uh, decided to uh, have that uh, Watergate have their own uh, ambient noise standard uh, or uh, category within uh, the zoning district. Based on information I uh, just um, explained uh, for the min high average and the high uh, of the highest L measured L50, uh, we're able to come up with some kind of recommended uh, exterior uh, noise standard based on that mean average and max av uh, highest L50. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, high residential, we have 65 for a day and then 60 during the night. And a medium uh, high density residential, we have 70 to 60. And uh, there's usually, as you can see, there's, we were finding that as a slight difference in day and night for most of them uh, <coughs> of the zoning districts, which is about five decibels. Until you get to like office technology, industrial, um, uh, mixed use with non-residential and um, mixed use uh, residential uh, where you get uh, the same noise level for the day and night and the reason for this is again it's because it's near noise sources that are constant throughout the day and night um, so um, and again uh, um, um, yeah, that's everything <laughs> um, <laughs> And it, yeah, and I'll be handing this over to Chris Sanchez to explain some of the options um, that we're proposing uh, to be updated to the city's noise ordinance. A lot of the things you'll be explaining will be based on this table. So uh, with further ado, I'll uh, pass it over to uh, Mr. Chris Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. I'm Chris Sanchez from ESA. Um, me move us along here. So um, we developed, we presented staff generally with some options for noise ordinance based on just our experience throughout, through communities throughout the Bay Area. Um, the first one was uh, based on zoning area, uh, using the data that we just, that Stan collected in September. And the idea being that you know, it would make it easier for enforcement officers because they would already know what the baseline is based on the data that we've collected. Um, option two is a different uh, method of creating a standard which is used in the city of San Francisco, which is an increase over ambient. Um, uh, that is a little more difficult to implement because you have to know what that ambient is without the source that you're out there the enforcing officers out there trying to um, measure. So that can be a little problematic to implement. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you. Uh, the third option we presented just as an, um, which is a uh, method that's used for live music venues generally that have um, uh, low frequency sound from bass can be particularly disturbing to people. The city of San Francisco does that. They use, um, Stan talked about uh, the DBA metric, um, for, but there's also a metric called DBC, the C weighted decibels, which capture that low frequency, which is somewhat annoying. So there is, um, in practice, some jurisdictions are using this DBC metric to address noise from live music events. So uh, let's see here. Objective noise criteria implement recommended. So we uh, 
in conjunction with staff, it was decided to focus on option one based on the work that we had done. And um, um, one of the jurisdictions we were also looking at was the city of Berkeley, which has these sort of several metrics that they use. And the idea behind this is that um, the L50 is a useful metric for things that are a constant noise source, like uh, air conditioning equipment, um, things of that nature. The, but you want to give people leeway. Um, you want to give people leeway to have some uh, noise increases, especially like something like a uh, public gathering or something of that nature. So there's other metrics that you, we, we're allowing to have the noise standards that we've developed based on our monitoring that can be exceeded up to a point. Um, so it, the advantages of this option one that we presented to staff um, was that um, you know you are allowed to make some increases in noise. You're not going to be penalized for you know being you know noisier than average on occasion. Um, some of the disadvantages are that you know the metrics are a little bit daunting at first to uh, to the people that are implementing. Um, so there's a bit of a learning curve to to uh, um, learning how to actually do this in practice. Option two, as I said, is used by San, City of San Francisco. Um, and this is just explained the things that I just spoke of. Um, you kind of have to know what you know the, the, uh, the noise level is without the offending source or potentially offending source. Um, but the, and this also gives some leeway for people to make noise beyond what is normal, too. And then option three is um, used primarily for uh, live music events. And San Francisco uses an eight decibel increase over ambient on the C-weighted decibel range. Um, so after talking with staff, they decided want, they wanted to focus on one. And I'm not getting any further in this progression. Frozen. Oh. 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 Nice. OK. OK, we're done. Howard. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, let's go back. All right. So we went with option one um, to <laughs> more fully develop it. And uh, this. Uh, I'm really struggling with this. Come on. It gets a little touchy from time to time. Mouse. We just click it, or? Yeah. Right, I'll try that. So I. So I want to go. Round up one. Tested updates. All right, I think this is where we're at. So the, as um, Maru pointed out, the existing ordinance doesn't really have any quantitative standards. There is um, some performance standards, but those are basically implemented when a, a project is being proposed, and that those performance standards can be put into the design of the, of the equipment or the building. Um, so again, we're proposing these standards based on the uh, time weighted metrics. We also propose a interior noise standards. N not all uh, jurisdictions have an interior noise standards. The city of Nogal does not currently have one. Um, the idea being that people can be annoyed uh, with, with they share a common wall and townhomes or things of that nature, buildings of that nature. Um, and so, and also the, the the state of California at one time, although it's very old now, uh, developed a uh, a model noise ordinance, and it included an interior noise standard as a consideration. 
Um, existing noise ordinance does not really define noise measurement proce procedures, which makes sense because they don't have any uh, ex existing standards. So we've um, included some updates to how to do that f for uh, implementing officers. Um, another <coughs> thing that staff said during the February study session was that um, the animal noise um, components were scattered throughout the, the uh, municipal code and so they would like it to be uh, consolidated into the upcoming noise ordinance so we have included that. And then um, there's the whole concept of construction noise. Obviously construction is an inherently noisy activity. Um, you need to, you know, it's prudent to let contractors have a lot of leeway with what they're doing um, up to a point. Um, we did a survey of other jurisdictions in the area, uh, like Emeryville, Alameda, and Albany do not have any construction, um, construction noise standards beyond time limits. Um, and then there are several uh, cities that have a numerical standard, typically 75 to 80 decibels of the property line, um, and uh, including Richmond and Berkeley. And then there's other jurisdictions which uh, have an increase over their ex the ex normal exterior standard of 20 to 25 decibels. That works about very similar to the, s the second column there, um, because if you looked at what uh, the proposed standards we had were typically 55 to 65. So if you add 20 to 25 to that, it's about in the same range as what um, is Richmond and Berkeley are currently using. Um, so construction noise ordinance um, or suggested update is to use the existing noise standards plus a 20 de decibel increase. Um, as I said, that's consistent with uh, Santa Monica and Seattle. Um, uh, it does exempt pile driving. Pile driving is a unique uh, construction activity. Um, it's it's inherently noisy. It, it, you know, to put a, no, uh, an, an, uh, a noise standard to it, it would have to be really high. I think. Um, the Federal Transit Administration uses uh, 90 to 100, um, and so m most jurisdictions exempt impact noise from such sources. Um, staff also wanted us to look at other sources like leaf blowers. Um, the existing ordinance has leaf blowers, uh, uh, considers them, but only as uh, similar to construction as a time. Uh, time of day allowance, um, and we we're proposing just to treat um, them as a construct as a construction equipment, similar to construction equipment. Um, parties and gatherings. Um, the existing ordinance talks about plainly audible the property line. Um, I think. You know, m most parties, if they're outdoor areas, are going to be noticeable. So it's very, it's somewhat vague, and we're proposing to, you know, to use the our exterior noise criteria for such sources as well. Um, there's some updates, proposed updates to the exemption, this, um, exemptions, including uh, school grounds. Um, you know things like bands and, and uh, football games, things of that nature. Uh, uh, activities on parks and playgrounds, like open space, if you have uh, live music and things like that. Um, emergency activities, obviously, um, are usually excluded and are proposed to be excluded as well. And that is a really brief synopsis of what we've been proposing, so um, I'm sure uh, we'd like to hear what you guys think and, you know, what your concerns are and what your suggestions are. I just have a question. I didn't see anything related to car alarms. Is that something that can be uh, ordinance put against or? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, 
It would definitely, let me see if I can control this at all. I mean, that, that would be an L max, but I mean, that's, that's a tough one to enforce. Yeah. I've, you know, typically they come out, I've, they end up towing them, at least in, <laughs> in Los Angeles when I lived in LA, that was a problem. Okay. Um, I would say that's the most common occurrence in all neighborhoods and they just tend to go on forever. And so I didn't know if there's any way we could mitigate yeah, that I, problem. I've never seen that included in a... a it would be hard, I would think. Yeah. I was hoping you had some magic. past history that you had a magic silver bullet for. Mm -hmm. Afraid not. That's all I have. <clears throat> Questions. So, um, ESA, Environmental Science Associates, that sounds very comprehensive. What what you're doing is related to sound and noise. Is there a name for the con, the the type of uh, individual or that does this? Is he called a noise consultant or a sound consultant? Yeah, typically a noise consultant is the most common. Um, you know, there's, there's also acoustical companies, but they typically get more involved in like designing the acoustics for, you know, concert halls and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, noise consultant is, there's no certification process for it. Um, but, you know, there are, some of us are engineers um, that, you know, that's more of a design uh accreditation for you know designing uh actually designing um air conditioning equipment or specific mechanical equipment so are there any good jokes that you guys have that you trade back and forth <laughs> when you're doing these studies um no we're usually pretty quiet because we don't want to uh, <laughs> disturb the measurement process so i'm i'm, I'm hope i don't regret asking this next next question um when you're doing the actual measuring, you have the long-term and short-term measurements that you took for Emeryville, and you said you did it between the 15th and the 25th of September. Does that mean you have a some kind of measuring device at, at a certain location for that three-day, for that 10-day period? Um, yeah, typically, uh, I, th I think our collection, we tried to collect both weekday and weekends at each location, um, so we could get that variance. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, when we, I'm sorry. Yeah, noise survey consisted of 10 uh, long term noise measurements, and I don't remember how many. It was a lot of short terms. Uh, each, uh, when we deploy, uh, we deployed uh, five <coughs> long term noise meters um, for the first uh, half of the noise measurement survey. Uh, while they're out in the field for that period of time, uh, we conducted short-term noise measurements in locations where we can't put a noise meter, um, for ex where it could be safely um, in a place in the city where it won't be um, uh, stolen or vandalized. Um, those short-term noise measurements were conducted during the same period as that long-term noise measurement where we were able to correlate a day-night noise level um, um, for, you know, we were able to correlate data with the two long-term and short-term uh, noise measurements. So if someone were to come to you and it's from the city of Emeryville and say, where can I go for peace and quiet? Where would that be in Emeryville? Um, like I said, the, most of the noise sources are more inland. Um, so did you measure out at the end of the peninsula? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we measured and not only in areas that were very loud, uh, we, we tried to uh, measure in areas that were, had a very low ambient where people uh, lived. So, so yeah, we tried to cover um, the um, the car city of Emeryville as best as we could. So um, this report, the report that we've been given, I guess part of it's by the staff and part of it is your information as mm -hmm. well. Uh, there's reference in, uh, let's see, I think it's on page two of six about, about uh, prohibited noises and then prohibited acts. Is that something that you're, you, I would be able to ask you a question about, or is that for staff? Uh, are you referring to the noise or the noise technical report? Well, it Fine. says here, chapter 13, noise. Oh, so that's the noise ordinance. Yeah. I'm sorry, I thought you were referring to the, uh, the noise study. Um, that would be staff then. Okay, uh, yeah. I'll reserve my question for Commissioner staff. Commissioner Banta, I can respond to that. If you look if you have your staff report there, yeah. Um, whoops, I'm looking. Can I? I'm sorry. 
if you look at appendix or at attachment uh, one, that is the current noise ordinance. And uh, da, 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 prohibited acts are listed on page two of that attachment. Okay. And prohibited, prohibited noises and prohibited acts are listed on page two of that attachment. Okay. So that's the current uh, noise ordinance. So while you're, uh, while we're on the subject, w what is the penalty for somebody who violates the noise noise ordinance? Would that be an infraction. I can't tell you what the monetary amount is. I could look it up, but I believe it would be an infraction. Is it a citation that's issued, and then your that could be. It that could has be. a dollar yes. penalty attached to it? Yes, that could be. Usually it's a warning first, but it, there could be a citation. Yeah, I know for uh, gatherings, uh, I, for, and the noise aren't for gatherings, they, um, if there's a noise complaint, a law, um, the citizen would contact uh, the, the police department, they would send over an officer and they would um, um, tell the person who's generating noise to cease, and if they need to be called back again, uh, they'd be responsible for um, the cost of uh, them actually coming out. So there is a, a monetary. Oh, you were at that party too. <laughs> so if, if there's gonna be a pop quiz on everything you told us, I wanna be excused from taking it, okay? <laughs> Do you have questions? No questions. No? Uh, Commissioner Banta, I can answer the question about penalties. And um, like Charlie said, it is an infraction. Um, usually it's a fine of $100 for the first offense, and it escalates to 200 for the second, and 400 for the third. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, is that in one day, like if the officer has to come back multiple times in one day, or, or is that for the, you know, run with the property? Uh, How do you count the times? So that is looking at the noise ordinance, the, the chapter thir 13, the one in Title V, mm -hmm. um, where that's going to be your loud parties. So it could be if an officer goes out multiple times because and writes a ticket each time because each one would be a separate offense. Okay. If it's going to be a violation under the planning regulations, and then it would usually be um, day by day is an ongoing violation. Got it, thank you. Question? Yeah, uh, regarding law enforcement, uh, I think it was mentioned in the presentation as well as in the report that uh, law enforcement can actually be trained to use noise measuring devices. Uh, are there local police departments or lo uh, police departments in the Bay Area that actually employ the use of noise measuring equipment? Um, I'm not aware of it. I know the city of San Francisco has a noise enforcement officer, but they are not a peace officer. Uh -huh. So they will go and they are trained and, and are able to implement their, um, you know, their ordinance. Um, I'm not aware of, you know, um, of any existing police department that's actually going out with no noise meters, but that, um, that may well happen. Um, my, as a professional, my experience is with implementing CEQA and monitoring noise levels um, um, after the fact, after they're already existing. So I'm like tr usually trying to help a client who's already been notified that they're in violation of the noise ordinance. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I have limited knowledge of, of, the, of what, you know, what the frequency of, of uh, police departments that have that capability. So if a city were to adopt uh, objective quantitative based noise standards, um, noise ordinance standards, um, how would then the law officer, law officer, officer be typically trained to, uh, to enforce that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, it, it would be a reasonably easy thing to do, you know, in a couple hours. I mean, it, it's not that it's not that complex. The mm -hmm. important thing is having the meter, having the right kind of meter and having it programmed correctly. And then after that, it's just a matter of reading the output. So it's not a matter of just trying to purchase noise measuring equipment for, for officers or? Well, I mean, obviously you're gonna need a noise meter if you're gonna be implementing a quantitative standard. 
how much if an officer carried it how much would that cost uh ballpark pro uh, a level two meter is probably around what 2500 yeah uh, a type one uh noise meter depending on the software that you would have on it um for your case you wouldn't need to have to measure one third octave band rate. you just have to log data in this case it's the l50 so a noise meter with logging capability from a company like larson davis mm -hmm. um typically costs and then off the top of my head um because i just purchased one last year uh, was about uh i want to say like like uh, five thousand dollars but that's a type one noise meter and usually those are used for like um, um something that you'd use like for a um compliance monitoring for a power plant where you need really accurate data uh, for the type of uh, monitoring that law enforcement here city here in the city never would be doing would be more in the case of a uh, need of a type two noise meter it's not as accurate as type one but it, it's accurate enough to give you a, a good uh, reading type two noise meters with a logging uh, capability uh, it's about um, around two thousand dollars gotcha into so, uh have a type one or type two uh, recorder ready to go, how long does it take to like set it up or is it just automatic? Uh, it depends on your settings. Uh, you could program the noise meter um, to log uh, L50 noise levels uh, for a certain period of time. And, and you can see on a screen, a law and officer, uh, you know, the officer could actually see the screen and, and see what level they're at and determine whether or not there's a violation occurring. Uh, I, I'd strongly recommend that law enforcement be taught how to adjust those settings, which isn't that difficult, just in case they're out in the field and uh, someone, they push the, the wrong button or something like that. Uh, these noise meters are relatively simple to use. Uh, someone who knows how to use a calculator, for example, could you uh, be able to use these type of noise meters with the proper instructions. So, Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the two tables, uh, table 22 and 23 that you um, displayed at the end of the presentation. Um, I noticed that the, the measurements um, for industrial in the city of Emeryville, uh, that your nighttime for industrial is lower, significantly lower than uh, daytime. And then in the recommended exterior no le noise levels, uh, you recommended a, a 70 and a 70. Um, and I just wondered if you had a comment on why that decision. I don't know if that's reflective of the noise measurements that we took. I mean, is that... Uh, yeah, looking at other uh, cities' juris uh, noise standards, usually they have high noise levels for industrial areas because they're inherently loud. Um, I, the no highest noise levels were around 66 decibels, but during noise survey, it was only a small snapshot uh, of the of the soundscape. Um, I, I thought it'd be a good idea to have uh, some like flexibility, because since industrial areas are inherently loud areas, I could have may have not uh, picked up uh, noise sources like a loading truck or a loud bang or something like that that um, this didn't show up, uh, didn't occur during my noise survey. Okay, and I wonder just because right now we have we have some of our industrial areas with multifamily residential in it, um, and so uh, the ability to have that higher noise level may not be a good thing, um, given that it's a pretty small community. That the the noise threshold at seven decibel that's not for a residential that's a noise threshold for people at the industrial area. But they're close to each other. If yeah. you look at the zoning, they're right uh, next to each other. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So the idea is that in the residential zoning, the residential standard would apply. You have to um, speak near the microphone. The idea being that the residential standard would apply to the residential receivers. Um, the 70 across the board for office technology mm -hmm. and industrial are just co are common, you know, they're, because they're not sensitive land uses, you don't apply a, a you know, we apply a very lenient threshold for sure. those sources. No, my point is that the land uses are not far apart in this community. They're they're not um, that it's not like you have a whole industrial district that is totally 
in its own area, and the residential is totally in its own area. This is a much more mixed use, right? Um, and that and that's why I'm sort of just looking at it critically and saying, oh, you know, we should think about that because that's that's yeah. the, the most different from. What's I mean, going in, on. in in one respect, we could, you know, <clears throat> because industrial uses and office technology uses are not usually complaining about noise, you know. Could potentially not even have them in the standard, but we we presented them in the tables so that we had the full spectrum of mm -hmm. land uses. Yeah, and I, you know, and I was just sort of I, I was struck by the contrast of the measurements to to yeah. the zoning standards, um, and where there was variation and where there wasn't, and it you know so it was you could see that the nighttime uh, multifamily residential had a differential, not as much as the industrial. Right. And you could see that the daytime multifamily residential had a differential, not as much as the nighttime. And so there was, there were some choices made about um, where, you know, intensity is allowable, a higher intensity than what is happening now is allowable. And I know there are limitations to where you measured and things like that. Right. But, um, but I just wanted to note that, that, you know, I was noticing those. No, it's a good point because everything else, everything else was tailored to our noise measurement effort, yeah. whereas those two are not. Um, those are a little more like a general, what a general plan, land use compatibility okay. um, might be. Okay, so no, and I just wanted to sort of point it out and, and discuss it a little bit and just make sure that's that good it... Good point. I, it's, it's probably mm -hmm. something we should revisit. Okay. I think we should discuss it a little <coughs> bit more later, but this is, with the study session, we have members of the public who are wishing to speak oh, I, to. I wanted to ask a question sure. that came up with the, with the equipment um, for the meters. What is the um, longevity of their calibration? How often do they need to be calibrated, and how difficult are they to calibrate? They're generally really easy to calibrate. I mean, it's, you basically... Um, you know, insert the the measurement measurement probe into into the calibrator, and it, it takes you know thirty seconds. So, would it be something you want to calibrate before you actually use it every time? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, ideally, the, the calibrator needs to be calibrated, <laughs> and the, and the meter needs to be certified on, on, a, right. on a regular basis. I, I can see if someone's getting a ticket, then they're going to lawsuit. Well, how when was your you know, equipment last calibrated? Right, how right. effective was it? And you know, we're just going to get into a long protracted thing over measuring these things. And I don't want to see our police officers getting in these long-term debates over a little bit of noise in the neighborhood. So I just wanted to put that out there. And um, going on about um, your comment about the noise areas, I think a good example of where that's going to become a problem, and we, we are going to want to further discuss this, is I'm thinking of Coulter Steel and Forge and the new Navy site project. Because Coulter Steel and Forge is probably one of the noisiest industrial things we have, and they're legal. They're, you know, they're there, and pretty soon we're going to have apartments right across the street from that. So we have areas where there's going to be some real conflict. So as we process this we're going to need to think of those things what is that facility coulter steel and forge mm -hmm. they're a steel plant they three. they stamp and pound and <laughs> and it stinks and but that's not a noise issue but yeah it's definitely a, a steel and plant use compatibility issue. Yeah. yeah and then right across literally across the street will be a seven-story apartment building and so that's where she was relating to is that is our industrial area that's what it's zoned for mm -hmm. and i don't know how we can mitigate and they're they're there they've been there and i don't know that we can lower their noise level to where it wouldn't work where they could do their job right before we go into discussion let's hear from the members of the public <clears throat> so we have cards for speaker cards from former commissioner joe lutz <laughs> I would also note that we have put at the dais in front of you an email that was received today from Mr. Lutz. Good to see you all. Good to see some uh, old uh, friends. Uh, name is Joe Lutz. I'm at Watergate. Uh, I moved here in uh, 74, so Watergate's pretty old. I met uh, Commissioner Banta around that time. And uh, Watergate, when it was built, uh, where I'm at, in Emory Cove, which is bounded by Admiral, Anchor, and Trader Vicks, uh, we have, uh, they're relatively small units, so we have uh, open air decks that uh, we use because uh, we need the, uh, um, the access. And we also leave our, do our um, windows open for um, air circulation because we don't have uh, uh, air conditioning. So this, is, this was uh, not a problem until uh, Trader Vic's decided after about 10 or 15 years to have an, a deck 
where they had parties, and that's where we've had a lot of problems. Charlie and Maru will uh, fill you in. I've uh, sent you a little bit of a note to give you some ideas. Now, um, Trader Vix has been uh, stepping up to the plate to help us out, and they're willing to do some mitigations on the deck, and they're waiting on the noise ordinance. I do have a couple of issues. I think uh, staff did a really good job, and ESA did a really good job. I was a little bit surprised to see that there was no sound intensity uh, mentioned on there. Sound intensity increases 10 times for a 10 dB increase, and that's the thing that really injures the uh, hearing and can affect the perceived volume. So that's an important thing. Uh, the other things I'd, I'd like to point out was on uh, page uh, 7 of the, um, uh, looks like the ESA report. Um, let me go back to something else, I'm sorry. Um, starting with the uh, Planning Commission uh, uh, staff report on page 5, you have Folsom uh, that has uh, exterior uh, noise uh, from 10 to 7 a.m. at 45 and 50 dB, uh, which and exterior uh, is in there too. And I think that's much more appropriate for the area that we're in, which is that Emory Cove, which is extremely quiet. Uh, if you go to, um, sorry about this, uh, page 7 of the report. Uh, this is the uh, measurements done at uh, Fran's uh, place, and you'll see that nighttime uh, is at 43, 43, 46, and 49 dB. The 49 dB, um, I don't know, I have a DBA meter that was uh, uh, certified by Stan's certification. It was on, Fran's was certified by uh, his, and it was on. And we've, we uh, normally had 43 to 45 dB. Um, I, uh, give me one more second. Uh, one more. Okay, what, I, what I'd like to, like to ask is why we're going to 10 p.m. Uh, instead of 9 p.m., which is what our current uh, uh, noise ordinance is. And uh, I'd like to see uh, the, the um, the proposed uh, 60 and 55 down to 45 and 50 on uh, page uh, 66. Thank you. Okay, we have a card from Mary Eileen Farrell. Okay. Fran Chapetta. I think he wants this to be 45 and 50. Sorry, people, we have three minutes apiece. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Fran Cipetta, and I live at Watergate, directly on the cove where Trader Vix is located. Um, and I live in the residence where ESA had placed one of their uh, testing meters, so that was my deck. Um, I am extremely concerned about how the noise ordinance will deal with our particular problem, which is noise emanating from Trader Vic's outdoor deck. In particular, I would like the Planning Commission and the City Council to bear in mind that this deck is located on um, Trader Vic's property. I'm talking about Trader Vic's uh, deck. It's located right on their property line. There's no buffer zone, no mitigation has been done at, um, at all. Just today, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a large gathering on this deck uh, midday around noon where uh, and I too have a meter that was calibrated with stands we came up to the exact uh, figures um, so I recorded the sound today this is noon and um, I'm gonna flip a page here this is what I came up with ambient sound from my deck was 44 to 47 dBs today the sound of people uh, gathered on the deck brought it up to 53 to 57 on my deck. And then I walked over to Trader Vic's to the property line and it was 60 to 65 dBs and they were just talking and laughing. This is with no music, no shouting, and no screaming, which is what they do. 
uh, in a typical party. So, um, flip this. So please consider our unique situation of sound bouncing around and being amplified um, with your consideration of it to acceptable noise levels. We would like to be able to, to certify our meters with the Emeryville Police Department certification tool, uh, provide readings in a manner that is actionable to the police department, and what would be the appropriate way to capture this. Uh, so we're willing, the three of us are willing to um, use our noise meters and work with the police for sure. Um, I, personally, I don't believe they need a $2,000 meter, a $100 meter, because of the range that we're talking about will be, accurate, will be adequate. So thank you for thinking of us <laughs> and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Mary Farrell? Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I live between Joe's place and Fran's place. Mm -hmm. The sound from Trader Vic's multiple parties a day on some days is amplified by the water and amplified by bouncing against the buildings and it will wake the dead when they're out there screaming drunk. Uh, this used to be, uh, the deck was just people would wander outside and talk. Now they have a bar out there and they get drunk and they scream. The noise meters that uh, Joe and Fran have only cost around $100. To our knowledge, the police have never cited them ever. I have gone down there and talked with the police in person to try and do a citizen's arrest because Trader Vic's refused to quiet a party with drunken people screaming. And sometimes they're screaming foul language. This is, we're, talking, we're talking about like an outside sports venue within 40 feet of someone's porch. This is not acceptable. What they will do is that there'll be mumble, 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 and then somebody will say something, and then everybody screams. You can't go out there on a warm day. We have to close our windows. We need to have the police department have standards where they can go straight to citations with a penalty. This is egregious, and I know that Joe has been working with them, and there's some things that they have improved, like the uh, emptying the garbage and you know covering the garbage, uh, le uh, letting people who are supposed to park on it. Anchor Street being able to park there when they couldn't before. That's improved. The main issue has always been the deck. It is so disruptive. It, I'm, I'm practically shaking thinking about it right now. Um, let's see if I want to, let's see. Uh, I'd also like to have a meter at my place. So if Joe and Fran are not available, I can provide the readings on my meter. Uh, they need to enclose their deck if they're going to continue with parties out there. They've done nothing to mitigate the sound, waiting to see what the city's going to do. But in the meantime, they have not done anything to make it better for us with the deck noise. Um, we wonder how the cabaret license fits. I wonder how the cabaret license fits into this. Because if they're having loud parties, you know, it's like a cabaret out there. They need to take that noise inside. Um, leaf blowers are another major problem. When I, I, I skimmed over the report, I didn't have time to look at it word by word. But I thought that the standard was not the lowest standard for leaf blower. And Watergate has horrible leaf blowers noise. And I represent the Residence Oversight Group, which has at least 80 members. And the leaf blower noise is one of the top of the list of problems that they have with Watergate. Okay. I appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Freund. Hi, my name is Ron Freund. I also live at Watergate, and I'm not going to talk about Trader Vicks. Um, but 
um, my wife is going to speak next, but she has a cold, and as I understand it, she can yield time to me. Is that correct? Is that correct, Charlie? Uh, that up to the chair. Well, I'll try to be brief, though. Try to be brief. Okay. So, uh, I have some questions first before I make a comment, which I would hope you could direct staff to respond to either tonight or in a report. It could be staff or ESA, either one. The first one is, how were the 15 comparison cities chosen? Is there a list of criteria? Are there models outside California or even abroad we should consider? Third, is there a proposal for quiet zones around the railroad crossings? When I read up on the decibel level of trains, it reaches 140 to 150 decibels at the time, I guess, of the whistle blowing, which is past the pain threshold. We can hear it at Watergate on a clear night. So, uh, fourth, is there anything we can do about motorcycle and sports car revving and boom boxes? I don't know if it's possible. Fifth, can we limit truck idling time below the state level. The state level is five minutes. I think it's too long. And especially at Watergate, we have a lot of movers coming. And when they leave their trucks idling, it's, it's very uh, noisy. Um, for Watergate specifically, and I'd really want an answer to this one, does the proposal mean that no landscaping equipment can exceed, even for a few ear-piercing minutes, the noise level of 80 decibels, which is the 60 baseline plus the 20 uh, increment that ESA recommended. And that would be 75 decibels at night. Why is it a 20 decibel increment? I don't think we can say that leaf blowers are inherently loud like construction. To limit, to, to lump them together, I think, is a, is a mistake. Um, uh, leaf blowers do not have a nature, uh, and there's nothing inherent that leaf blowers cannot be made quieter. So I'd like us to uh, look at other cities and uh, that limit leaf blowers or set lower decibel levels to compare to, because let's try and be the model. Let's find the best possible uh, ordinance we can make to make the quality of life better in uh, our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do you want to, does Mrs. Forn want to speak? Well, I okay. sort of, I was hoping that some of those, how would you respond? How are these questions going to be? I think dealt? those are questions that are going to be addressed by staff and ESA in their further, we're just, this is a study session and we're just taking, we're, we're ask specific questions and we're considering specific issues. The council is the one who are making final determinations on these things, so the council um, forum would probably be the more important one to, to make those points at, but they'll, they'll hear those questions, definitely. Okay, yeah. prior, thank you. Thank you, all right. Seeing no one else that wishes to speak, we'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. Anyone wanna? I don't want to start. <laughs> Who would like to? Sure Who would like to say something? <laughs> Linda away. would like to say something. Um, I, I don't have very many comments. I agree with, you know, Steph's um, picking option one in this proposal. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going through the questions here. Um, so I guess I'll just go one by one. Um, I do agree with the proposed exterior noise standards based on the zone areas, um, as well as interior uh, noise standards to be included in the ordinance because as Commissioner Thompson said, we do have a lot of mixed use in the city. Um, <clears throat> uh, and. I'm okay with having the um, construction noise standards be based on time. Um, and the, the exemptions seem appropriate to me, so I'm... Um, well, 
Carlos says. I would just go down the list and say that I agree with um, Commissioner Barrera that this is a good start. Um, I am just concerned with, um, as being someone I wasn't on the general plan of the state current committee, but I was very closely attached to working on that. And I know that we worked very hard on making an industrial area that we wanted to keep. Um, and um, I think it's, we do have a lot of people like in um, liquid sugar lofts that are pretty close to those areas and the native site is gonna be pretty close. So we need to look at how we could address those uh, border areas that businesses can still come here. Um, luckily, we're gonna get into more higher tech and probably quieter rather than heavy industrial. But um, Colt de Forge is here. Um, I don't know what other other areas, but we need to look at that. We need to see how those, how those areas transition because I think they're pretty important to quality of life. So other than that, I, I agree with the items to be considered and what Commissioner Barrera said. Um, I do also uh, agree um, in terms of the questions in one and two um, that the um, exterior noise standards um, and the interior noise standards uh, should be included in the ordinance. Um, uh, I, I have some concerns in terms of uh, noise levels um, it, where my fellow commissioners have uh, mentioned um, where the industrial sites meet residential um, and think that also should be something that we consider uh, moving forward. <clears throat> Well, um, I uh, actually don't understand a lot of the uh, technical aspects, despite your comprehensive presentation, uh, which is to say that I don't feel like I would know one way or the other whether this was a good noise level or not. I think that the, the community in general needs to understand wh why you are making the recommendations you are just in plain English what it is that that for example as, as I understand it you're recommending a an increase of 20 decibels above something I don't know what exactly for many of these uh, uh, conditions so I think it's I think the I guess my my uh, request would be to have things made more easily comprehensible as to why we you are making the recommendations you are second thing is the the penalty for uh, exceeding the decibel level it's been explained to me that there would be a citation that could be issued first one's a hundred dollars second one's two hundred dollars third one's four hundred dollars those are significant amounts for an individual citizen to pay and and they should be they sh they would be uh, you know pow I think significant uh, discouragements to uh, continue on with the noise but an institution like Trader Vicks for example I think that those those dollar amounts would not really be necessarily uh, discouraging to them. They might weigh that against the uh, money that they're making with the party and decide, well, that's just the price of doing business. So there might be, it, it brings up another question which I think is really at the heart of all this, and that is that, that uh, really this should in in a sense be about conflict resolution that uh, you know arguments over noise can become very personal and they can escalate quickly and they can cause tremendous uh, discomfort and dislocation to the individuals involved with it uh, so I wonder if in your experience as consultants if, is there are there any kind of clever ways that uh, cities have uh, developed to address a peaceful and orderly resolution to conflicts such as these that might come up? I don't know if that's a that's a non-starter of a question or not, but it seems that it's that that we are going to be we're we're talking about creating regulations that will will be the the rules the kind of the, the 
mark out the playing field for how these conflicts are, are resolved. So if there's any uh, advice or mechanisms that help to accelerate the resolution uh, to, to in a way that's satisfactory to both parties, that's certainly would be welcome to hear that. So, so I have a question for staff um, before I offer comments and, and a set of questions. Um, will this issue uh, come to this body in a subsequent study session or will it be now dealt with the city council exclusively after tonight? Well, it kind of depends. Uh, the noise ordinance is not part of the planning regulations, so it's not part of the municipal code that requires a planning commission recommendation before going to the council for adoption. However, the uh, performance standards, of course, are part of the planning regulations, and the general plan is another thing that requires a, a planning commission recommendation to the council. So if in order to ensure internal consistency, as Miru mentioned, between the noise ordinance and the performance standards and or the general plan, if we have to amend any of those other things, then those will need to come to the commission for a recommendation before going to the council. Um, just at face value here, it appears that we are going to, if, if we go with the consultant's recommendation for the zone-based noise levels, and if they are similar to what's being proposed, that's different than what's in the current performance standards. So in order to make them consistent, we would have to amend the performance standards as well. So I think what we are ha planning to have a uh, study session on this at the City Council in January. And after we get the Council's direction, we'll have a better sense of if we're going to need to amend the performance standards and the general plan. My sense is that we probably will need to amend the performance standards. I'm not sure about the general plan. So I suspect that this probably will be coming back to you for a recommendation. But if it turns out that the only amendment that's made is to the noise ordinance and nothing else, then that would not need to come back to you. Gotcha. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate that. Um, so um, there's a set of comments I want to make, just not just uh, direct and not just said. Um, my colleagues on the dais, but also maybe to the city council, maybe to offer some di some directions, some questions they can formulate in advance of uh, when they consider this issue. Um, it seems like the objective standard, um, while it might you know might be something that's really fair to enforce, I see a lot of problems in trying to enforce an objective standard. Um, conceptually, I agree with uh, trying to come up with it, but. Um, uh, I think enforcement might be a really difficult thing to do. Um, uh, namely, uh, I think there might be a reason, this is all conjecture, it's just an assumption, but I think there's a reason why uh, there's no police department uh, uh, in the Bay Area according to um, um, our consultants that don't have uh, mobile voice cords that police officers carry. One, they're expensive. And two, uh, if they are expensive, if reliable ones are expensive, uh, I don't want our law enforcement officers to be worried about breaking or damaging them in the normal course of their business or when they're responding to emergencies. Um, uh, that's, that's one issue that I, I just love further study on by, by us and the city council. Um, another issue that comes up for me is that um, having uh trying to rec say we trained officers to to use equipment which might be it seems like it's hard to get around the the use of not using equipment um if we were to create uh numerically based objective standards um <clears throat> if you have law enforcement using them that could potentially turn into fourth amendment issues of, of search and seizure issues uh when you're collecting data from from residents, from business owners, what have you. So it could be a problem that could open up our city for all kinds of liabilities. So uh, I would just like further study on that issue and whether that has been something that's been encountered by other jurisdictions. Um, uh, I'm intrigued by this idea of, of a fixed recorder, though, for hot spots and problem areas. Um, I think that is one option to certainly look at, um, given just the concerns of our neighbors at Watergate. 
Um, one thing I think would lead to further illumination about what the extent of the problem is there is um, whether it be us or and or the city council is examine um, what is the record of citations that has been um, imposed upon Trader Vix. None. No. I would like that. I would like that as an, an official report, if the, to, to corroborate that, because um, if s somehow maybe enforcement is lacking or it's not working as a deterrent, something is missing. So I think getting a record of what the citation record is of Trivix, whether there is or is not, uh, I think would provide some more complete analysis. Um, I'll conclude my comments there. Yeah, no, I think I think I agree with the um, the exterior noise standard, and just I just wanted to kind of make sure that it's tailored right, and you heard my concerns around that. Um, the interior uh, noise standard, I think that's a good idea and included in the ordinance. Um, I think s same with the with the construction. Um, I did want to just note I wanted to make sure that the um, proposed exceptions is the for consideration that I'm considering the right one. Um, the school grounds, the parks and playgrounds, the mechanical devices, and uh, anything that's outdoor gathering sponsored by the city. The, um, I just I noticed it was different than what the city council suggested. You know that the children at play was listed as a separate one. So I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right. Thing. You are uh, looking at the right thing, and children at play uh, is supposed to be included. Uh, I will correct that in okay. my report to okay. the city council. Okay, and I, I just noticed that that was different, so I wasn't sure. Um, okay, then and I want to say that if that's supposed to be included, I would agree with that. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. Um, I think it would be useful to have in the report, in the staff report, that chart that talked about what levels of de decibel difference are perceptible. And I'm recalling that you were saying that 10 decibel difference can be perceived as being twice as loud. So I'm wondering about the idea of making allowances for certain things to be 20 per decibels above. That seems like I need to get a better understanding of that. I think it's good to have some kind of objective standards, and it sounds like something that a police department could uh, work with. But I'm really kind of concerned about the fact that our town is such a patchwork of different zoning areas. And I'm looking at the zoning map here and seeing that there are um, mixed use non-residential that have 75 and 75 um, decibel levels, you know, daytime and nighttime on the same block without any even street separation from residential high, which has a levels of 65 and 60. So I'm concerned about how that works when you've got somebody next door across the street or in the adjacent building that has a different um, allowable noise level. That seems kind of, um, that seems like it could be really problematic. So I don't know how that would be addressed. I think that um, it's useful to get these readings. I mean, clearly we have areas along the railroad track where there is noise now, and we hope that we'll get quiet zones, which won't resolve everything. But again, on one, a whole group of properties adjacent to the tracks have a 65 and 60 decibel you know, rating here and other ones in the same relationships to the tracks have 75. So I'm a little concerned about the way this is broken out and whether it really is realistic. So finding the pattern that works makes, seems to be a lot of, um, seems to be a big challenge. Um, I think that it would be good to have interior noise standards. I think that though it's, you know, when you're in an apartment and you're hearing the people next door, it's not a pleasant thing. It's good to have some more insulation stuff. Um, regarding the construction noise, I know that some construction noise is necessarily going to be 20 decibels higher than the, you know, allowable noise, but I think we need to combine that with time limits. I don't think we need to, I think we definitely shouldn't remove the time limits that are on these excessive noise situations. Um, a list of proposed exceptions sounds appropriate, and um, I think making specific mention of the truck idling could be a really important thing too, considering how much mixed use we have in the city and how many deliveries and that. So addressing truck idling seems to be an important thing to include. And that's the only, com that's my comments for this.
You have another one. Yeah, yes. as usual. Um, so I have a question for staff. Is there any uh, report or record of the number of noise complaints that are lodged in the city every year? I guess they would be lodged with the police department? Uh, yeah, that would primarily that be the police department. We get a few, um, one or two maybe a year. Those typically are about the performance standards in the planning regulations. Somebody has a loud piece of uh, HVAC equipment on a roof across from them that we have to deal with, but that those are pretty few and far between. I'd say it's less than two a year. So do you, I uh, think that the um, report that was included with the earlier, with the February 2016 um, council session said that there were 268 complaints in two, 2015. So that's, that's like a lot more than we every, get. You know, yeah. So that's, and that ranges. 96, yeah. Every, of every type, I presume, like. That was to the police department. Well, those, well, by every type, it's every type that would be a violation of the noise ordinance, not the performance standards. But that's 99% of them, probably. So, uh, you know, I, I think that Commissioner uh, Kang pointed out the problem of uh, enforcement it, it's a challenging puzzle because without some kind of measuring device, you really are not going to be able to uh, uh, prove that somebody has been exceeding the criteria. And yet, uh, it, it would be, I mean, I'm, what I'm hearing, what I heard the consultant say is that uh, San Francisco has a noise officer or, or a, is that right so that would be you know probably not something that the city is going to do but yeah I, I don't know it's it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky complex thing <laughs> yeah okay well I guess that's our direction as far as what we're passing on to City Council and thank you very much for that. So that would okay. close the study session, and we're on to commissioner comments. I would say happy birthday to Commissioner Guerrero. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll be on a plane in the morning time. <laughs> nice time in Hawaii. We'll be thinking about you when we're here next week. Yeah, exactly. Happy birthday to you, to you too, Gail. Oh, thank, <laughs> you. Yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Then we'll adjourn the meeting. Get this right this time.